1. Fear begins. Is it easy to get on the baseball team? Mrs. Crane asks one of her students. Yeah I just had to get a health checkup. So, I went to the doctor to make sure all my bells and whistles are in order, he replies. It's not supposed to whistle, shouts Scott. The class erupts in laughter. Even the ever-serious Mrs. Crane can't hold it in. Sometimes Mrs. Crane wants to angrily shout at Scott to shut his loud, annoying mouth or else she would staple it shut. But, on occasion his outbursts were a welcome relief from the stressful nonsense she endures as a high school teacher. She tries to hide a smile. I shouldn't laugh, but that was funny, she thinks. Scott smirks as he stands up to get a drink of water, aware that the class's attention is still on him, he pats a quiet classmate's head while passing. Good doggy. Scott says loud enough for the entire class to hear. Again, everyone laughs except for Max, disgusted at being treated like a dog. Mrs. Crane waits for the class to settle down to begin her lesson. What makes him think it's okay to touch me? I don't know him. How can he think it's okay to pretend I'm a dog to make himself seem cool? He thinks. He imagines shouting, don't touch me. He even opens his mouth to say it, but feels a noose tightening around his neck. He often gets asked awkward questions by classmates. Why are you so quiet? Why don't you talk? He always imagines shouting back, why are you so noisy? But he usually just responds with, nobody asked me anything. I'll talk when people talk to me first. The truth is, fear keeps him from sharing his thoughts. Sharing the wrong opinion could equal rejection. The craving for acceptance consumes his every action. Terrified of exposing his true personality, he clings to a protective shell made from everything he hopes will win him social approval. Some people don't mind being carbon copies of every other person. Sacrificing individuality is worth the comfort of acceptance from others. But for Max it's a living nightmare. He always felt driven to be unique. In first grade his teacher said something that changed his life. Most people in the world are right hand. So, put the pencil in your right hand like this. The statement confused Max. Max immediately picked up the pencil with his left hand, and decided to write with it for the rest of his life. If most people in the world do something, then why should I want to be like them? He thought. He didn't want to copy what everyone else was doing. The instinct to develop his own personality conflicted with a natural desire to seek the approval of others. The more unique he wanted to be, the more he would need to hide. Of course, he couldn't yet articulate these things in those words, but he felt something was wrong. Okay hand in your homework from yesterday, Mrs. Crane demands. Students start pulling pink worksheets out of binders for Mrs. Crane to collect. Max opens his binder and realizes he forgot to do the homework. His heart pounds nervously as Mrs. Crane approaches his desk. He'd seen her yell at students for not finishing homework before and did not want to be on the receiving end of her scolding. Where's your homework? She demands while glaring at him in disbelief. Committed suicide because you gave it too many problems. Is what he wanted to say. Funny statements often came to him, but he never shouted them out in class. He fantasized about getting even more laughter than Scott did. But then he felt the eyes of his classmates staring at him. Sorry. I forgot to do it, he admitted. Two, one year later. With his back to the cafeteria wall, he eats. Occasionally he eats with a classmate, but only when invited. Daydreaming about living a different life, 
he doesn't even notice when his only friend in school walks up to him. Hey Max, how's it going, asks Jason as he sits down. All good, comes his response. I thought you ate at the second lunch, Jason asks. I did, but I changed classes, so I think I'm always eating first lunch this semester, relieved that his only friend in school would be able to eat with him, Max relaxes a little. Did you see the McGregor vs. Aldo fight last night? Max asks. That wasn't a fight. It was over before it even started, Jason huffs. I wish I could knock people out like that, fearlessly and precise. People like Scott? You'd get your ass kicked. I just wish he'd stop calling me blubberface all the time, Jason mutters in a dejected tone. Max chuckles. Just tell him, at least you are fat and not ugly like him, because you can lose the fat, but he can't lose the ugly. Funny, but I don't think so. Did you see what he did to Steve? Steve got the black eye when he tried to hit him but missed, lost his balance and fell down, Max says shaking his head. Yeah but then Scott kicked him while he was down, Max interjects. At that moment, Max notices Scott walk past two English teachers nearby. That kid gives me the creeps, he never blinks. Max overhears one say to the other while still looking at Scott. When the bell rings signaling the end of lunch break, he quickly throws away his trash and walks to his locker, but his left ankle catches on something solid in his path. He tries to kick away but isn't strong enough and he ends up falling face first into the concrete floor. Blood drips from a small cut on his face and his bruised chin stings from the impact. Nearby students laugh. He looks back to see Scott's hairy calf extending into his path. Rage builds. He thinks of the conversation he just had with Jason. Filled with adrenaline, pain, and overwhelming fear, he stares Scott in the eye and barely stutters out a response as he stands back up. Why, why did you trip me? Trip you? You must have tripped on your crappy clothes. You really should be more careful where you walk. Scott keeps staring and never looks away. You're the one with shitty clothes. You think you're cool with that stupid sticker on your hat? Do you have to prove you are too retarded to know how to remove stickers from your clothes? Did you put on that ridiculous affliction shirt thinking it was going to make girls like you? Do you like being an unoriginal idiot like everyone else? The words were ready to launch at his foe, insults Max wanted to shout at him for a long time, but they were locked behind a brick wall. He opens his mouth, but the invisible noose around his neck only tightens. He drowns in the ocean of words he wants to spew out. Scott smirks as Max breaks eye contact and limps away. In the restroom, Max wipes the small trail of blood from his cheek. It doesn't hurt, but the embarrassment and his inability to fight back is much more painful. Memories of torture flood his mind. He thinks of all the times Scott threw balls directly at his face in PE class. The most embarrassing moment was when Scott poured a cup of brown pudding on Max's pants one day and kept shouting, that loser crapped his pants. Kaylee, the girl Max liked, ran away gagging in disgust because she didn't realize it was only pudding. He replayed all these memories getting more pissed as each one flashed back into his awareness. Every day was stressful as he went out of his way to avoid Scott and several other jerks. Then he had an epiphany. By doing nothing, he was showing Scott it's okay to treat him this way. When he got home that night he was still high on adrenaline and stressed out rage. He knew what he needed to do. He needed both the courage and skills to defend himself. He didn't like bothering his father with his problems, 
but it was his best chance to not only overcome his fears but also live the life he built for himself in his fantasies. He walks into the living room and nervously asks. Dad, can I take martial arts lessons? I want to try MMA, boxing, or something like that. No, came the sharp response. Two harsh little letters were all it took to massacre his hopes. But some jerk tricked me today, and I want to know how to defend myself. If he does it again kick him in the nuts. We don't have enough money for martial arts lessons. Besides, gas costs ten bucks each way to drive into town. I can't afford to do that several times a week, so you can learn to break boards with your hand. You can do that here for free, his dad surmises. Max had nothing to say. It was impossible to negotiate with his dad on anything. It was easier to keep his mouth shut. Max wonders how people could have children without the ability to provide everything they need to grow. It seemed selfish to him. I hate my life, he thinks to himself on the way back to his room. The uncomfortable weight in Max's chest gets heavier. For several years Max has been obsessed with martial arts. He always watches martial arts movies when they are on TV. Fight scenes aren't just a showcase for fancy moves. They are paragons of one man's will over reality. Underdogs with less training would win fights all the time by the power of their dominant mindset. Max admires the confidence, strength, and will of his on-screen heroes because they possess all the characteristics he lacks. Studying martial arts became his dream. He didn't just need training to know how to throw a punch. He knew he needed it to learn discipline and improve his belief in himself. Finally, he could overcome his fear of physical confrontation. Without martial arts lessons, it seemed impossible to become the man he was desperate to become. I hate all those lucky people. Their families have money and they can go study whatever they want. But I'm stuck here, and I can't grow, and nobody cares. If I can defend myself I will finally feel safe. When I'm safe I can relax. When I can relax, I can finally do everything I want. What if I'm always terrified of talking to new people and rejection? Maybe I'll always be afraid. No. I can't always be afraid. I can handle anything. Even this. He imagines a future version of himself yelling at the full power of his voice. Get out of my way. Scott cowers in fear. Afraid to lose his status as the cool kid that can get away with anything, he wouldn't give up easily, but Scott wouldn't have a chance. A solid set of knuckles would sting his face and erase him from existence. For a brief moment, he felt a taste of the relief he could feel if all the bullies and stress disappeared from his life. It wouldn't magically happen. He had to show them there were consequences for messing with him. I don't need to be afraid. I can do this. I don't even know how, but I need to try. What if I never get my fears under control? He imagines being a loser his whole life. His imagination shows a reflection of himself in a mirror. The face that looks back is unrecognizable. A face with no emotion, and a weak body. This version of himself gave up each of his goals, one by one. They became sacrifices deemed necessary just to survive. A weakling stuttering quietly when people ask him questions. Too scared to make eye contact, people would. Avoid talking to him. I don't want to end up like that. It would be so much easier if I could take some martial arts classes. Three, several months later. It is difficult work nailing boards between two trees to support its weight. The black canvas has a few discolored spots because he bought it second hand. 
Max drags the bag over to connect the chains. He smiles when it's all set up. Though still exhausted from his work, he attacks the heavy bag wildly with his bare fists. He leaps back and forth as his fists strike the bag repeatedly. He continues until sweat drips down his face and soaks his t-shirt. I'm going to practice every day. I just need to know how to throw a strong punch if I need to use it someday. I should find some books to teach me. At the library, Max looks through dozens of books on martial arts to find what he needs. He spends hours skimming books before deciding to borrow two. The Tao of Jeet Kune Do by Bruce Lee and the Complete Mixed Martial Arts Training Program. He goes home and sits near his punching bag while reading his books. A lot of the theory seems difficult to comprehend, awareness is without choice, without demand, without anxiety. In that state of mind, there is perception. Perception alone will resolve all our problems. So just pay attention without getting nervous and my problems will be solved. Then how do I stop being nervous? Plenty of practical self-defense information filled the book as well. The jab, cross, hook, uppercut were described with plenty of tips for increasing efficiency. Max memorized as much as he could about each strike before practicing it on the punching bag. He also read other books and watched videos online for clearer instructions. Though informative, he still hoped to eventually join martial arts classes. He read a little every day to review how to throw punches properly and learn a little more. Then practiced footwork, jabs, crosses, hooks, uppercuts and elbow strikes for at least an hour each day. Imagining the bag as Scott's face, he punches with all his power moving up from his feet as he twists all his momentum into each strike. After the first week of daily training he could barely walk because his ankles were in so much pain. Large blisters formed on his feet. After each rest period he came back stronger. He was proud of the calluses forming on his knuckles and feet. He practiced this way for an entire year. His calf muscles became huge from thousands of rotations on the ball of each foot, as he repositioned his weight to the exact position required to maximize his punching power. At school, Scott still occasionally teased him. Max usually pretended to ignore the taunts. Each interaction made him feel more like a defenseless slug. In the back of his mind he constantly worried he wouldn't have the guts to fight back the next time Scott physically assaulted him. 4. Fearless Max Max wakes up an hour early with a smile on his face. Flashes of a strange dream run through his mind. In the dream, he sees an ideal version of himself as a superhero. The hero encourages him to face his fears and live without regrets. Don't let Scott kill your confidence this time, the hero shouts just before Max shifts into wakefulness. Full of energy, he spends a few minutes punching the heavy bag. He goes through all the strikes and combos with a smile on his face. With the help of books, videos, and dedicated practice, Max did indeed feel more confident and capable of defending himself and facing any situation in life. He finishes his training session with a 10 minute meditation. After several slow, deep breaths, he visualizes his bullies insulting him and the words having zero impact on his emotions. He recites a Bruce Lee quote from memory Emotion can be the enemy. If you give in to your emotion, you lose yourself. You must be at one with your emotions, because the body always follows the mind. There was just one problem, he still didn't believe he was capable of exerting his confidence if he never stood up for himself. No matter how much he practiced, there was always that nagging doubt that he would never succeed. He already let his bullies ruin his life and never demanded respect before, why should he believe next time would be different? What if I never face my fears? 
The question brought painful images of a future life unlived. And then he wondered, what if I do it? This question came with images that excited him. He imagined he would finally feel brave enough to speak up in class. He arrives at school a little early this day and runs into his friend. What's up Jason? Oh, hey. Do you have the math homework? I couldn't figure it out, Jason asks, a little embarrassed. Yeah sure, but I think some of these might be wrong. It was kind of hard, Max admits as he retrieves his homework to let his friend copy the answers. Suddenly the books in Max's hands fly to the ground as Scott goes out of his way to bump into him from behind, and then keeps walking down the crowded hallway. Annoyed and filling with anger, Max fights the instinct to keep his mouth shut. Even though his voice sounds a little nervous, and he can't stop his hands from shaking. Don't do that, he says loud enough for the bully to hear. Without even turning around, Scott shouts back at Maximum, stay out of my way loser. It felt good to demand respect, but Max knew this wasn't over. I would have kept my mouth shut, admits Jason. Of course, you would have Jason, but I can't be afraid anymore, Max utters. Are you sure? I mean you throw punches well on a bag of sand, but how can you be so fearless? That jerk terrifies me. He terrifies teachers too, but if I always act like a timid rodent I'll always be treated like one. The only way to get respect is to show I'm willing to bite back. Jason squints a moment before replying. I don't know man, I don't want people to think I'm a jerk. So, I don't do anything. I don't care when he calls me a fat ass or any other rude comments from people I don't care about. That passive acceptance of his BS makes him feel like a king when in fact he is a violent jerk, Max points out. Jason's eyes widen, and he smiles as he responds. True, but it just really doesn't bother me that he is a jerk to everyone. I don't need his respect. Max shakes his head. Yeah, I get it. It's easy to accept how awful he is to everyone because you don't feel it as badly, but when you passively accept how he treats everyone it also shows you don't care about them. This time, Jason shakes his head and raises an eyebrow. No way. I care about people. But it's impossible for me to protect everyone from jerks like Scott. Anyway, see you later. Jason responds before ducking into his classroom. After sitting down in math class, Max thinks about the conversation he had just had with his friend. The memory of Scott smashing his books to the floor flashes into his awareness. Max daydreams and ignores the lesson, as he usually does when deep in thought. I wish I could just get respect by being nice. Suddenly, Max realizes his opportunity to bite back might come even sooner than expected. At the end of the day, several PE classes will join for roller skating. That means Scott will also be in the gym and undoubtedly looking for a chance to torment him. When the time comes, he enters the gym and looks around. Scott doesn't seem to be here today. Slightly relieved, but still nervously anticipating something terrible, Max extracts a pair of black roller blades from the pile and straps them on. After skating a slow lap around the gym, the loudspeaker plays music. Something from the 90s. Max doesn't know the name of the band or song. He never pays attention to those things. Out of my way, shouts Todd, one of Scott's friends, as he pushes Max while passing at high speed. Nearby classmates see this and laugh as Max wobbles and narrowly avoids falling down. Scott gives Todd a high five while laughing and skating up to his buddy. Skating nervously as the cortisol increases, he thinks today might be the day. Racing through the crowd of skaters, Scott circles around for his turn at tormenting the loser. 
he didn't hate Maximum. He was simply addicted to the praise and approval from his peers when embarrassing social outcasts. Though mostly subconscious, he feels a hint of this pleasure igniting as he anticipates the attack he is about to launch. Scott gets closer and slows down. Without passing, he pushes Max hard in the back. Max's skates dance wildly as the wheels spin out of control. Crashing to the ground, his hands and knees ache from bracing for the impact. Hurting more from humiliation than the fall, Max looks up while considering retaliation. Now is my chance. I must do something. Scott skates by Max as he lays on the gym floor. Now or never. He didn't realize it, but this was a critical choice that would change his life forever. Would he invest in courage, or fear, I'm ready. Max reaches out and grabs Scott's right leg. I'll do it this time. He thinks. Gripping tightly, Max pulls hard and fast without the slightest hint of hesitation. Time slows down as Scott's face smashes into the shiny wooden floor. The loud smack of bone and skates on the hard surface gets everyone staring in their direction. In that same instant Max feels an enormous weight evaporate from his chest and shoulders. Adrenaline pumps through his veins. He feels something he has never felt before, freedom. He hurries to take off his own skates and stands up firmly on the gym floor, eyes locked on Scott. As Scott starts to sit up, Max feels the lock that imprisoned his voice melt away. For the first time, his voice is free to speak as he wishes. What is wrong with you? You like pushing people around. You think it's funny? Never touch me again. Max shouts in a booming voice he didn't even know he was capable of. Other students stop skating and quickly form a circle around the spectacle. Scott looks up and hesitates before speaking. You got in my way loser. He looks away as he stands up. Feeling the eyes of other students focused on him, he suddenly feels an intense fear of embarrassment. He skates a little closer to Max, the skates give him a few more inches of height as he towers over the threat. In my mind I've beaten him thousands of times. This should be easy. You are the loser now, Max says, unable to believe the words coming out of his mouth are his own. He feels weightless and free. Cortisol and adrenaline surge through Scott. Noticing all the eyes on him, Scott suddenly fears embarrassment at losing a confrontation with a loser. A dangerous cocktail of fear and anger propel him forward as he tries to punch the threat to his status in the face while screaming. Instead of fear, Max feels calm and ready. Even more so when he notices Scott's roller skates leave him off balance while trying to throw an untrained strike. Max evades by taking a step to the right, then launches. An uppercut under Scott's chin. He throws it with the intent to give a warning, not to knock him out. Scott's feet shoot into the air as his head moves closer to the hardwood floor again. Noticing the jerk collapsing to the ground in front of him, he feels time slow down as he is forced to make another choice. Oh great. Should I help this jerk? If his head hits this floor it could be dangerous. Hesitating a moment longer than necessary, Max reaches out to grab Scott's arm to slow his fall. That's enough, Max thinks before letting go and letting him finish his descent at a safer rate. Sitting in pain from the strike and embarrassment, Scott stays on the ground with an annoyed look on his face. You. Max cuts him off and raises a fist. Apologize for pushing me. Okay. I'm sorry, Scott says in a voice just above a whisper. Thanks. A few students clap as Max walks back to his skates, puts them back on and continues skating. Wow man, that was amazing. I really respect what you did, says Zack, 
one his classmates. After class, even the PE teacher praises his courage. I saw what you did maximum. For a moment he worries he is about to be punished, but notices the smirk on the teacher's face. Happy to see you stand up to that jerk. Thanks. Soon everyone was talking about what happened that day and no one ever bothered Max at school. He no longer spent the entire day fearing embarrassment and ridicule. People didn't necessarily respect him out of fear, they respected his ability to assert his will over reality. He finally believed he was capable of confidence. He made more friends, and sometimes even shouted out funny things in the middle of class. He finally felt safe enough to express himself. 5. Fearful Max Do not allow negative thoughts to enter your mind for they are the weeds that strangle confidence, Bruce Lee. What's up Jason? Max asks. Jason looks up and smiles. Not much. How you doing? Kind of tired. Didn't sleep well last night. Max responds. Oh hey, do you have the math homework? I couldn't figure it out. Sorry. I couldn't figure it out either. This is too difficult for me. He responds. Suddenly, the books in his hands fly to the ground as Scott purposefully bumps into him from behind and keeps walking in the crowded hallway. He stutters out a response while looking at the ground. Don't push me. It comes out in a low whisper that Scott doesn't even hear. Careful, he might hear you talk back, Jason points out. I have to talk back eventually. I gotta go to class. CYA later. CYA. Sitting in math class Max suddenly realizes that later he will likely face more torment from his nemesis in the upcoming PE class. He imagines the torture he is about to endure. What if he pushes me again? I don't know if I can fight back. I know I have the skills, but I'm too afraid. His throat tightens at the thought of arguing with Scott. He crosses his arms and continues to worry until the end of class. In English class Max also zones in and out of concentrating on the lesson and even worse thoughts about encountering ridicule and embarrassment. Finally, he gets to his PE class. The students select either a pair of skates or rollerblades and strap them on. Max enters the gym and looks around but doesn't see Scott yet. Hands shaking with nervous energy, he straps on a pair of skates and slowly makes a lap around the gym. Out of my way! Todd, one of Scott's friends, shouts as he pushes Max while passing at high speed. Students laugh as Max struggles to keep his balance. He sees Scott and Todd laugh about the embarrassing moment. Not today, he thinks. Racing through the crowd of skaters, Scott circles around for his turn at tormenting the loser. Scott gets closer and slows down. Without passing, he pushes Max hard in the back. Max's skates dance wildly as the wheels struggle to maintain traction. He falls hard to the ground, pain shoots through his limbs. Now is my chance. I have to do something. But what if I get in trouble? What if I get kicked out of school? What if he hits back and I get hurt? What if my face gets cut up so bad by his fists I'll be too ugly for anyone to ever like me? Scott skates by maximum. It was now or never. It was time for Max to make a critical choice that would change his life forever. Would he invest in courage, or fear, he reaches out to grab Scott's leg. But hesitates as the negative thoughts flood his mind. What if they beat me up? What if I get in trouble? Though desperate to stand up for himself, the mental block paralyzes his actions. 
Instead, in this reality, Scott rolls by unimpeded. Max stays on the gym floor a few more seconds as tears form in his eyes. He sits up with pain shooting through his body. After removing and returning the skates, he exits the gym and goes home. Weeks pass. He stops practicing strikes on the punching bag. Using it only reminds him of that day in the gym. The skills he learned were useless if he wasn't willing to use them when necessary. To cope with increasing depression and anxiety, he eats more junk food and puts on weight. Anxiety and asthma attacks interrupt his normal function. Several times he even ends up in the hospital because he can barely breathe. Every morning he wakes up tired and reluctant to get out of bed. Sleep becomes his unconscious refuge from the lack of control he has over his life. 6. Fearless Max goes to school. She walks by his desk. The smell of a flowery perfume and freshly washed hair lingers in the air. Though impractical and unnecessary for a university course in graphic design, she walks gracefully in a pair of black high heels. Her twisty hair and chest bounce with each step until she sits at her own desk two rows in front of Max. Her figure and scent excite him. His eyes widen as he tries to maintain a good view. That's the hottest girl I've ever seen. I hope I can talk to her. She's a little taller than me. Would she even talk to a shorter guy like me? I bet she only dates good-looking, jack guys. After an hour of learning the basics of Photoshop, the class finishes. She takes her time to put away her laptop and send a text message before standing up to leave the classroom. As she walks to the door she makes eye contact with a young man sitting two rows behind her desk. He is handsome and well-built, nervous excitement fills his chest. He looks away instantly. I should have at least smiled. Next time I should say, hi. She walks past him. The intoxicating scent returns. I should at least try. He walks behind her and admires the view for a moment before walking next to her to ask a question. But the words won't come out. What should I say? I don't know. I could ask about class or compliment her. I don't want to sound stupid. I'm so nervous. He opens his mouth to talk. He almost stutters on the words. Hey nice bag, he says, pointing to the Tiffany blue backpack with a transparent heart on the back displaying the contents. A Winnie the Pooh keychain and a small, brown bear attached to the zipper are indeed nice, but it's clearly an excuse to start a conversation. She looks down at her bag and then back at him. Oh, thanks, she says while smiling politely and waits to see if he says anything else. His heart pumps quickly. His palms break out in sweat. He tries to look her in the eye but keeps looking away. His mind is blank. Oh crap. I better say something before she runs away. So, what's your name? He asks in a quiet voice at high speed. Naomi. Nice name. I'm Maximum. Okay. Well, I gotta go to my next class. CYA, she says, walking away. CYA. That was so awkward. I don't know how to talk to girls. He walks a moment before turning around for one last look. She stops as another male classmate talks to her. Playing with her hair, she crosses her legs as if she has no intention to leave soon. Her eyes light up. She smiles and laughs at something the new guy says. Max feels uncomfortable but can't explain it. He turns around and heads to his dorm. Of course, she's happy to talk to him but runs away from me. He's built like Thor. 
Later that night Max is in his dormitory playing a round of eight ball with his old friend. He strikes the cue ball trying to sink the eight in the corner pocket. The cue hits the eight, but in the completely wrong spot and it rockets off to the other side of the table. What the heck? The ball was right by the pocket. You are usually much better at this. You seem distracted or something, Jason utters in astonishment. Yeah, I tried to talk to that girl after class today, Max casually admits, hoping not to have to explain what happened. How'd it go? I just told her I think her bag is nice, Max answers while pretending like his attempt wasn't as bad as it sounds. Jason laughs. Do you want to date her or her bag? Max considers the question. Good point. I just had no idea what to say. The worst part is that right after we talked she stopped to chat with some guy who clearly works out. It's like I have to be some handsome, rich douchebag, and go to the gym every day for girls to even look at me. It's not fair. Sounds like nonsense to protect your ego bro. How can you say crap like that when you've seen the girls I've been dating lately? They are cute. And I'm a fat bastard, Jason says flashing a grin. Yeah but I just thought you were lucky, Max admits. Jason takes a shot and sinks his last ball into a side pocket, winning the game. Screw luck. That's just an excuse to justify ignoring the real problem. Girls don't care I'm a fat ass at all. They only care if I care. They might tease me a bit about my weight to check my reaction, but when they see I'm not bothered about it, we relax and get to know each other. You probably came across as really nervous or something. Max stares at the pool table. How could women care more about how I feel about myself than my appearance? I see attractive women with good-looking guys all the time. So, did you just approach every girl until you found girls that were easy to date? Dude that's not nice, Jason spouts. Just because she likes me doesn't mean she's easy. I just approached until I met girls that enjoyed my company. I had to fix some bad habits, but it's been worth it. Like what? Max asks. Like speaking really fast, because I'm worried the conversation will end. Women are sensitive to all the crap in your body language that says you don't like yourself. If you like yourself, it's more likely other people. Will too, Jason professes. I guess that makes sense, Max responds, not completely convinced. It's so funny that those same guys who claim appearance is so important wear unfashionable clothes, have bad haircuts and poor grooming. If they think appearance is so important they should do something about it, like go to the gym and dress better. I go to the gym myself, but I'm too busy going on dates. Max laughs as he realizes the logic to this, but still squints an eye in skepticism. I know what you mean, but if I was good looking I'd get more attention from girls. I often see girls checking out the guys that work out. They never do that to me. First of all, you look okay. Second, staring at a guy doesn't mean she wants to date him. It's like if you see a beautiful car like a Bugatti or a Ferrari. You'll stare at it because it looks good but admiring it doesn't mean you want to invest your life savings into buying one. What do you mean? Max asks. What the heck bro? Is it not obvious enough? Girls like looking at a guy but it doesn't mean she wants to invest her time and energy into sleeping with him or dating him. Also, she might not even believe she is good enough for him even though she stares. Just like you might not have the money to buy a luxury car, but you'll enjoy the view when you see one. Max feels an uncomfortable tensing in his chest as the new world view goes to war with the old one. I don't know man. You make these logical points, and I know you are smart, 
but I just don't believe it's possible for girls to be interested in me. I still don't even know what to say. Jason collects the balls into the triangle to prepare for the next round. While concentrating on the task he explains further. Just another sign that you think you aren't good enough to talk to girls. You don't need special lines. Talk about boring stuff to show you are a normal person, and sometimes talk about more interesting things to show you have personality. It's not some gimmick to keep a girl trapped in conversation with you. It's a natural process that builds trust between people. When you are busy worrying about what she thinks about you then you are too afraid to say anything. You sabotage the whole process before it even starts. Still feeling skeptical Max asks one more question. So, it's not the words you say so much as it is the intention? And my intention should be to not care about keeping her attracted even though I hope she will be? Seems a bit paradoxical. It is bro. But that's how it works. Want her but don't need her. Don't get but hurt if she doesn't want to talk to you. Needy behavior kills attraction, Jason says as he continues with his life lesson. I think it will take time for me to believe that. You just need to socialize more. I'll take you to some parties. There are plenty of great books out there that can help too. Like what? Read Models, Attract Women Through Honesty by Mark Manson. It has a more mature approach to dating. Then you just have to be social and talk to people. Learning about this stuff has seriously changed my life. I'll lend it to you. Sure, I'll have a look. I hope it helps, Max says. I'm sure it will bro, Jason proclaims. 7. Fearful Max goes to school. She walks by his desk. Wow she smells good today. He thinks to himself. Why can't I get a hot girl like that? After an hour of learning the basics of Photoshop, the class finishes. She takes her time to put away her laptop and send a text message before standing up to leave the classroom. As she walks to the door she makes eye contact with a chubby young man sitting two rows behind her desk. Nervous excitement fills his chest. He looks away instantly. I wish she would smile at me first. She walks past him. The intoxicating scent returns. He walks behind her and admires the view for a moment before walking next to her while debating whether to talk to her or not. But the words won't come out. I don't know. I could ask about class or compliment her. This is so scary. His heart thunders in his chest and he worries that she can hear it. He opens his mouth to speak. He almost stutters on the words. Hey nice bag, he says, pointing to the Tiffany blue backpack with a transparent heart on the back displaying the contents. A Winnie the Pooh keychain and a small, brown bear hang from the zipper. She looks down at her bag and then back at him. Oh, thanks. She smiles politely and waits to see if he says anything else. His heart pumps quickly. His palms sweat. He tries to look her in the eye but keeps looking away. His mind is blank. I better say something before she runs away. So, what's your name? He asks in a quiet voice at high speed. Naomi. Nice name. I'm Maximum. Okay. Well, I gotta go to my next class. CYA, she says, walking away. CYA. That was so awkward. I have no idea what I was doing. He walks a moment before turning around for one last look. She stops as another male classmate talks to her. 
playing with her hair, she crosses her legs as if she has no intention to leave soon. She smiles and laughs at something the new guy has said. Max feels uncomfortable but can't explain it. He turns around and heads to his dorm. Of course, she's happy to talk to him but runs away from me. Why do girls have to be so superficial? Later that night Max is in his dormitory playing a round of eight ball with his old friend. He strikes the cue ball trying to sink the eight in the corner pocket. The cue hits the eight, but in the completely wrong spot and it rockets off to the other side of the table. You suck worse than usual today, Jason ribs Max. Shut up Jason, I'm just feeling awkward because I tried to talk to a girl today. But she totally rejected me. What happened? I just told her I think her bag is nice, and then the conversation was pretty much over and she ran away, Max admits, his dejection showing. Jason laughs. How can she reject you when she knows nothing about you? You didn't even show any interest in her. Do you want to date her or her bag? She didn't want to talk to me but right after had a nice long chat with some jack jerk. Why can't girls be less superficial and recognize how nice I am? You don't even know if she'd be a suitable partner for you or not. She didn't reject you, she rejected the awkward feelings you gave her. The next guy who talked to her was probably just more fun to talk to. Jason takes a shot and sinks a ball into a corner pocket. Max avoids making eye contact and stares at the pool table as Jason continues his turn. Inside his mind keeps repeating the same thoughts. Why'd she reject me? How come jerks get all the girls? Fun to talk to? I'm fun to talk to too if she would have given me a chance. Max, she gave you a chance by listening to what you had to say, but you only had a lame comment about her bag. There were no positive feelings. You weren't trying to build a connection you were trying to get something from her by pretending to admire her bag. It's sneaky. Feeling annoyed at the lack of support from his friend he fires back. Sneaky or not, it would work if I was good looking. You see what you look for bro. You've already decided girls aren't interested in you. Max doesn't quite understand what his friend is talking about. It doesn't matter what I believe, I know what I've experienced. Girls just never pay attention to me. Let me tell you, it is not any easier for me. I had to learn how to accept rejection before I could avoid it. Yeah, maybe. Max sets his pull cue down on the table. I think I'm done for today I'm pretty tired. CYA. Good night. 8. Phyllis Max and the party. Max grabs a drink from the table. Music blares out of speakers near the DJ. He turns around and sees her. Naomi. I should try to talk to her. But she is with another guy and girl. His hands shake as he thinks about approaching them. Maybe I'll just stand by the wall and wait for Jason to get here. No, that's stupid. I should get over this stupid shyness and take action. He moves closer. The other guy keeps holding her attention. I feel so weird just standing here waiting for this dude to shut up. I want to talk to her, but I'm so scared. The weight in his chest gets heavier with these negative thoughts. But just as cortisol was about to shoot through his veins and keep him locked in his loser mindset, he has an idea. Taking a step closer, he asks, hey how's it going? Naomi, right? Without hesitating, she replies, yeah, it's all good. So how do you guys know each other? Max asks trying to keep her attention. These are my friends Jack and Kaylee. 
We all took the same acting class last year, Naomi explains while Kaylee ignores the conversation and scans the room. Naomi continues paying attention to both Jack and Maximum. Hi guys, Jack says smiling and offers his hand for a shake. Jack squeezes Max's hand hard while shouting. Nice to meet you, bro. You play any sports? Max pulls his hand out of Jack's grip. Well this prick is intimidating. Max realizes. He answers but feels a weight in his throat and is unable to respond at full volume. I don't. But I used to practice B. Jack ignores his answer and turns to talk to another girl passing by. Naomi starts talking to her friend Kaylee. Max feels awkward as he stands nearby. Come on turn around. I didn't come here just to say hi. I should ask her to dance. Kaylee raises an eyebrow when she notices Max try to reopen the conversation. Hey do you wanna, sorry we are having a conversation, Naomi replies. Max laughs and walks away. What kind of stupid excuse for not wanting to talk to me is, sorry, we are having a conversation, in a loud nightclub. At least I tried though. Now I know I can start conversations in this kind of place at least. A cute girl in a plaid skirt makes eye contact with Maximum. They smile at each other. Who are you? he asks with a smile. Flora. You? Maximum wanna dance? Sure. At the edge of the dance floor, they dance together. I'm actually not so good at this. Teach me your best moves, Max commands playfully. Well how about this, she responds and pulls him in close while trying to climb him like a tree. They almost collapse on the floor while laughing. Okay, now I get to do that to you. No way, she says smiling. A few moments later she goes to talk to her friends. He gets her contact details before she runs off. This is so much fun, he thinks as he turns to another girl and starts dancing. A wide grin forms on his face. She smiles back. At that moment he spots Naomi in the corner, kissing another guy. What that hell? That's Jason. He knew I liked her. Whatever, I'm still having fun. He returns his attention back to the girl. Grabbing her hand, he spins her around so that when she stops she is facing his back as he continues to dance. She grabs his shoulder and spins him around and pulls him closer and leans in for a kiss. He finally feels brave enough to express himself to everyone authentically and see who he forms genuine connections with. 9. Fearful Max and the Party Max grabs a drink from the table. Music shouts out of speakers near the DJ. He turns around and sees her. Naomi, but she's talking to another guy. If he goes away I can try to talk to her. He moves closer. He waits. He waits some more. Damn it. Why can't this be easy? Why can't she just come talk to me first? Okay, he's finally talking to another girl. Now is my chance. But his feet won't move. He feels like he is cemented to the floor. His hands shake as he stares in her direction. Briefly, their eyes connect. What if I say hi? But what if that guy tries to beat me up or embarrass me? She looks away. He walks around the club. Mimicking some dance moves, he instantly feels self-conscious. Club dancing is so weird. I feel so stupid. Why do people do this? Do I look good? Are any of these girls looking at me? His movements stiffen until he can barely dance at all. Hey that girl is hot I should talk to her. 
No way, she is too hot, what if she slaps me? What about that girl? She is even by herself. I could if I really wanted to. But I'm just not interested enough in her to try. So, it's pointless to even think about it. He convinces himself to avoid talking to every girl he sees throughout the night. I feel so tired. None of these girls are talking to me. Bunch of stuck-up, superficial bitches. They'll only talk to the good-looking guys, but not me. I'm going home. He walks out the door and sees them across the street. Son of a bitch, he mutters out loud. Jason and Naomi stand there kissing and fondling each other. Damn it. He knew I liked her. Now he's seducing her? What kind of lame friend is he? Jason takes her hand and leads her to his car. They get in together and drive away. Angry and jealous, he collapses onto a nearby bench. Why can't I ever get the girl I like? That jerk isn't my friend anymore. He never supported me anyway. Always trying to change me. 10. Fearful Max and the First Date Still chewing on the fistful of French fries tossed into her mouth, she asks a question. So, you been on many Tinder dates before? No. This is my first time. I rarely get matches, Max replies. Well I don't go on a lot of dates, but you seem nice. Thanks for offering to buy me dinner. No problem, but you look different from your profile picture, Max points out. Oh. The image of the cute picture from the profile flashes in his memory. She's a lot fatter than I expected. At least she pays attention to me though. So. See any good movies lately, he asks, changing the direction of the conversation. Yeah, I watched the new Transformers movie. It was great. Those robots are so cute. Though he finds the movie stupid, he lies to his date. I love Transformers too. The date continues with more boring conversation. Eventually they go back to his place. Somehow neither of them has high enough standards to reject the other. 11. Fearless Max's Bad Girlfriend Max is busy designing a website when his concentration is interrupted by a knock on the door. He opens it to see Kaylee, his girlfriend, standing there. Tears streaming down her face. You don't answer the phone, so I came here. Can't you give me a second chance, she pleads. No. We were together for a year. It was good until you cheated on me. I should have known you didn't respect me because you always insult me. Get out of here, he says, slamming the door in her face, he goes back to work on his website, but he finds it difficult to concentrate. I should just forget about her. She comes here begging for a second chance. I can't believe she's the one who wanted an exclusive relationship in the first place. She obviously meant I'm expected to be exclusive, but she is free to do whatever she wants. It's fine. I'm free now. I even have two dates next week. 12. Fearful Max's Bad Girlfriend He looks down at the message he reads in her phone. Anger builds and he drops the phone back down on the McDonald's table. How can she have time to mess around with so many guys? Finally, she comes back from the restroom. She sits across from him. He looks angry, but his eyes are watering. What's wrong? she asks. Who is Josh? And Derek? And Deepak, he demands. You been looking in my phone? That's so rude to invade my privacy like that, she shouts. Otherwise how would I know I'm not the only one? You even said you'd only sleep with a guy who was your boyfriend. 
Was that a lie? I'm sorry. Maybe we should just break up, she says while taking a bite of her cheeseburger. Max feels betrayed. He looks away from her while wiping away a tear with his sleeve. If she leaves I have no one. He worries. Please don't break up with me. I'll give you another chance. Well, okay, but no more looking in my phone. He finally relaxes a little, but the intense jealousy remains. He looks into her eyes without blinking and makes his stance clear. Just don't go sleeping around. I'll try to make you happy, so you don't need anyone else. Wow that's so sweet. Okay, no problem. 13. Fearful Max vs the Psychopath Sitting in his dorm room trying to study, Max lets out a yawn. It isn't a very loud yawn. Three seconds later he hears a loud commotion in the hallway. Someone is screaming and swearing like crazy. Shut the hell up, it's so noisy. Be quiet. His adrenaline slightly elevates. But he doesn't feel threatened because this yelling couldn't possibly be directed at him. He walks to his door and peeks through the peephole to see a fat guy with glasses, poor teeth, and dirty clothes standing there with emotionless eyes. Everything all right out there? Max asks from his room. Suddenly a fist repeatedly crashes onto the other side of the door. Yeah, you should get out of here. Suddenly adrenaline and cortisol shoot through his veins. His heart beats so fast he can feel it trying to pound out of his chest. He tries to open his mouth to yell back, but the words can't escape. What is this lunatic's problem? I only yawned. I did mumble a bit to myself earlier but then it's a simple yawn that sets him off. The pounding on his door and the swearing continues. I've never heard anyone this angry before. It sounds like he wants to kill someone. Eventually, the lunatic returns to his room. The silence contrasts sharply with the murderous screaming of seconds earlier. His body still shaking. Max takes out his asthma inhaler and inhales several deep breaths of the medication to prevent himself from choking out of air. He tries to sleep but is completely awake all night. This is so much scarier than that loser Scott trying to pick on me in high school. If I couldn't defend myself against that idiot, what am I supposed to do against an actual psychopath? In the morning he leaves his room to go to class. Even though he didn't sleep, the excessive adrenaline keeps him energized and alert. Upon entering his dorm building, he sees him again. He feels a tightening in his chest and throat. Staring forward to avoid eye contact, he walks forward. As the creep waddles past he intentionally bumps into Max's shoulder. The creep stumbles back a bit. Crazy. I better not do anything. He might try to stab me. A few days later, the creep intentionally bumps into him again. And again, fearful Max does nothing. That evening Max goes back to his room. Suddenly, the creepy lunatic starts screaming again, stress hormones surge through Max's body. He turns to stare at his door. I didn't even do anything. What the hell is wrong with this lunatic? Stop slamming doors idiot, the incoherent, murderous shouts continue for another minute. Then the lunatic returns to his room, intentionally slamming his own door hard. His whole body shaking, fearful Max gets up to look through the peephole and make sure the lunatic is gone. I didn't slam the door. I just shut it like I normally do. I know these walls are thin, but reasonable people don't go nuts about small crap like this. Just as he is about to take his eye off the peephole and struggle to sleep, he sees the lunatic step back into the hallway holding a baseball bat. 14. Fearless Max vs. The Psychopath 
sitting in his dorm room trying to study, fearless Max yawns. Three seconds later he hears a loud commotion in the hallway. Someone is screaming and swearing like crazy. Shut the hell up. Be quiet. Alert, but feeling unthreatened, he walks to his door and peeks through the peephole to see a fat guy with glasses, poor teeth, and dirty clothes standing there with dead, emotionless eyes. Everything all right out there? Max asks from inside his room. Suddenly a fist repeatedly crashes into the other side of the door. Shut up, the lunatic shouts. Suddenly adrenaline shoots through his veins. His heart beats faster. What is wrong with this guy? I've heard angry people before, but this is nothing like that. It sounds like he's an evil demon intent on killing someone. The lunatic continues screaming and punching his door. Make noise again and I'll kill you. Fear and rage build up in Max's body. The memory of confronting Scott in high school flashes in his mind. I handled that jerk before, I can handle this one too. He takes a slow, deep breath to calm down. His hand trembles slightly as he reaches for his door, but he stops. What if he hits me? I'll just hit back. What if he keeps screaming about random noises? What if he thinks it's okay to treat people like this, he quickly resolves these worries by realizing, if I do nothing I'm not just allowing him to disrespect me, but also allowing him to victimize others. He takes a long, deep breath to prepare for the confrontation. After opening the door, he steps into the hallway. Staring at the psycho, Max calmly demands in a loud voice. Hey, you are the one making noise. If you can try to be quiet, I can be quiet too. I have no idea what you heard but I wasn't making much noise maybe you heard something from someone else's room. The lunatic stares at fearless Max without blinking, returns to his room while mumbling. Be quiet. Max quickly returns to his room and locks the door. That was the creepiest experience of my life. He just stared at me without blinking. Just zero emotion and a complete lack of empathy. The next day upon returning home Max sees him in the hallway. The psychopath's ugly stare returns. Never blinking. Never looking away but he doesn't intentionally bump into Max as they cross paths. Seeing the psycho triggers the same fear and rage Max felt the night before. He feels instant relief when the intense eye contact ends. That was way too creepy. But I feel so much braver now after doing it. If I have the courage to stare down a psychopath and demonstrate I'm not afraid, then I can face anything. A few days later Max hears that the psycho was arrested for breaking into someone's room and beating them severely with a baseball bat. The news scares him. What if I never stood up for myself? That could have been me. I'm glad I face bullies, but some people are so scary it's probably best to completely avoid them. 15. Fearful Max vs The Psychopath Part 2 the cheap door shakes with each whack from the aluminum bat. Get out here, the psychopath screams, barely coherent. Max's entire body shakes. He stares at the door. Desperate to scream at the psycho to get away, he only manages an inaudible whimper. What if that door breaks? I guess this is it. I'm going to die. Wham. A large crack appears next to the lock. Max sits on the floor frozen in place. Tears rolling down his face. I should get up. I should fight back. But what if I get hurt? As the psycho takes a step into his room, shouts erupt from the hallway. Stop. Stop, two policemen rush to grab the psycho. 
they struggle briefly before flipping him to the ground and restraining him with handcuffs. They escort him to their car and lock him inside as he continues to scream. One of the cops returns to the scene as Max struggles to catch his breath with the aid of his inhaler. What happened, he asks Max. Though relieved, Max's heart still pounds furiously from the trauma. Still hyperventilating, he stutters while talking. I, I don't know. That guy is nuts, he just starts randomly yelling all the time. And not like any normal angry person. Normal angry is annoying and can make you uncomfortable, but the way that Psycho yells. You can hear the intent to kill someone in his voice. It's the creepiest thing I've ever heard in my life. I'm so scared. When I hear it, I feel like I'm already dead. We got a report of a disturbance, and luckily we got here in time, the officer says before leaving. Max is left alone in his room. He lays down in his bed, but he can't sleep all night. I'm so lucky. I almost died. I don't know what that psycho's problem is, but I should move. I can't face it if he comes back. I should have fought back. I can't let people treat me like that. I just sat here and let him insult me and scream at me with that murderous tone. He's insane. But I'm also crazy to let crazy, inconsiderate people treat me like that. 16. Fearless Max and the Job How long did it take you to become manager of this dump? Toby asks while returning a shiny orange. Bowling ball to the ball rack. I wouldn't consider it a dump. They made me manager after about six months of cleaning and cashiering like you do, Max replies. It must be fun for these stuck-up customers mocking me with all their disposable income they can use to go have fun, but I don't even make enough money here for one damn round of bowling. And you even went to college, right? What are you even doing here? Toby asks. I don't make much more than you. It's tough to find a job, especially in graphic design. I make a little extra with freelance work. I'm mostly just here to pay for a project I'm working on. Toby rolls his eyes and smirks. What project? A website that sells camera accessories, and I'm trying to become a freelance photographer and travel the world supporting myself with my skills and the website, Max asserts. Are you good at photography? asks Toby. Not yet, but I'm learning. The website is already making a little money. I'm thinking of leaving here in a couple months actually, confides Max. Man, good luck with that then. I'm too much of a coward to try something like that. Even during the busiest days he works willingly, but in the back of his mind is the thought. I need to get out. The thought doesn't stress him out. It isn't resistance to working this job. It is only a reminder that it is time to move on. Many people tell him it's safer to keep the stable job. Being manager of a large bowling and Entertainment center isn't so bad. Though he enjoys bowling, billiards, and other games he can play there, he constantly daydreams about starting his own business. In his fantasy, he scales up his online camera accessory shop as big as it can get. With the money, he travels the world, studying martial arts as he wanted to as a kid, and eventually starts his own chain of boxing gyms. Finally, he must choose to pursue his passions or stability. After months of contemplating quitting his job to focus on his own business, he says goodbye to his boss and co-workers for the last time. After officially quitting, he throws his work shirt in the trash on the way out and smiles. Walking to his car, he contemplates his plan. Okay, I must work hard now. It's time to wake up early, improve my skills and produce results. 
I have enough money to survive about six months, I can figure this out. 17. Fearful Max and the Job Donna sits on the couch in the small one-room apartment. Max enters, and she asks. How was work? He sighs and looks down at the ground. I got fired. What happened, she asks, wiping potato chip crumbs off her stained t-shirt. A customer was yelling at me because I gave the wrong change back. He acted like I was trying to steal from him, but it was just a mistake. Then I got nervous and couldn't figure out how to use the cash register. He wouldn't stop yelling at me and I just stood there. My mind flashed back to that psycho that tried to kill me in college. So many people are so inconsiderate, and I have no idea how to deal with them. Well, that doesn't sound too bad, how could you be fired for that, she asks, prodding Max for the whole story. The guy working the register next to me came to fix the problem with the register, even though other customers were waiting and then that jerk customer threw a drink at me and tried to jump over the counter to hit me. Why do all these crazy people think it's okay to treat me like that? It isn't the first time something like this has happened. Anyway, the manager was so pissed about the incident I got fired. So, how are you going to pay rent? Maybe another fast food place is hiring. I hate working fast food though, he replies with a sigh. Why don't you find a job, he asks mostly out of fear of being unable to pay rent rather than annoyance at her lack of contribution. I tried. I got an education degree to become a teacher, but no one is hiring. I sent out my resume, but they don't want me, she screeches. Then do something else, he begs. Like what? I don't have any skills. I don't know how to do anything. Do anything. I hated flipping burgers and mopping the toilets, but at least I got a paycheck, Max urges. Donna considers getting a real job. The thought of spending all day on boring tasks makes her feel sick. I can't. Max feels a nervous tightening in his chest. The thought of becoming homeless and losing everything flashes into his mind. He enters his bedroom and lies down. Why is this all my responsibility? Why can't she help me? Why do I have to find a boring job and waste my valuable time just to survive? Pain and frustration builds in his body. He suddenly realizes what he must do. I should break up. She's just using me. Max takes a deep breath and returns to the small living room where Donna sits inhaling the last crumbs from a bag of chips. Hey Donna, can I talk to you? We just talked, is her only response. I mean about something else, he manages to stutter while avoiding eye contact. Her eyes widen, and one eyebrow raises higher than the other. Don't be weird, she demands. He feels a gigantic bubble of nervousness forming inside him. To pop the bubble and release its tension all he needs to do is tell her to get out of his house. The words are loaded like bullets on the tip of his tongue ready to annihilate the target. He prepares to fire. Get out. Get out. Get out, repeats in his mind. I have to tell you, I, he mutters feebly. What is it, she asks as she rolls her eyes and returns attention to the TV. The bubble thickens and expands. But what if being alone is too painful and difficult? Dependent worries plague his mind, robbing him of the free will to overcome this fear. Nothing, he finally says, before walking back to his room. In the morning he wakes up to find Donna sitting on the couch drinking a beer and watching cartoons. Babe can you make breakfast, she asks. I always make breakfast, he responds, barely awake. I did like two weeks ago. 
Cereal doesn't count. Come on it's your turn again, Max pleads. Donna sits silently for a few moments before responding. I'm too comfortable here. I don't want to get up. Well, maybe that's exactly what you need, he shouts suddenly. She immediately snaps her head in his direction to face him. Wow, I know you are stressed out about losing your stupid job, but don't yell at me like that, she demands in an even higher tone. He feels a slight spike of adrenaline before avoiding eye contact. I, I'm sorry, I am stressed, but you could be more considerate. It's also considerate to cook for your girlfriend, she responds sarcastically while rolling her eyes. The nervous bubble builds and grows another layer of frustration. Max stands there silently doing nothing for a few moments. He then proceeds to make one armlet. Thanks. That smells good, Donna says. He pours it onto one plate and eats it all himself. Hey where is mine? Donna asks, baffled. Make it yourself if you want one, Max orders. I couldn't have one bite. You are so inconsiderate. I'm inconsiderate. You are the one who doesn't want to find a job. I'm stuck trying to find a job to pay for both of us. Max points out. Getting money ain't that hard. Gary makes lots of money. Why don't you go work with him? Donna offers. Gary is an idiot. I'm not becoming a criminal like him just to pay for your junk food addiction. You are just afraid of everything aren't you? Getting money to survive is more important than rules. She insists. I follow the rules because they are all I have. They are the only guide that give me a sense of security, Max responds while straining to maintain eye contact. Whatever, just don't become a jobless loser. Get some cash somehow. Oh, I have to meet some friends soon. Find a new job. Sure, he sighs. Living in a hazy fog of fatigue and depression, he wastes several days watching TV while constantly procrastinating on the hunt for a new job. Every time he considers looking for a job, a frightening scene of stuttering through an awkward interview plows into his mind. In his imagination, rejection is inevitable. Eventually, he sends out his resume to several places. A furniture store, an auto parts importer, and even several graphic design studios hoping for a chance to finally develop his creative talents. None invite him for an interview. Though relieved to avoid the interview process, his stress increases daily. At least he wouldn't need to impress any potential employer. Yet, at the same time running out of money is even more frightening. On a Tuesday, he wakes up at noon. Checking the time, he blurts out. Oh, I woke up early today. Donna is absent from his tiny apartment. I guess she already went to hang out with her loser friends today, he thinks. He sits down on the couch and drinks a can of beer followed by a coffee. Turning on the TV, he stumbles upon an old episode of a show called The Real Hustle. The original British version, not the lame American version with horrible acting and lamer scams. In the show, the hosts con unsuspecting victims out of money or valuables to demonstrate how people can avoid scams. This particular episode shows the con artists pretending to be waiters at a restaurant to steal customers' credit cards. Max sips his coffee. Maybe Donna was right. Rules just help braver people take advantage of the weaker ones. I wish I could try stuff like this. I don't have the guts to break the law though. All rich people are criminals. The only way to really succeed is to cheat. I borrowed some money from Gary, so we can survive a few more months, but it's gonna be tough. We need more cash you know, she announces. 
Max glares at her. How can you borrow money from that lowlife? I wouldn't dare owe such a loser money. He's not a loser. He's a successful businessman and he's my friend. You aren't getting a real job, so our only option is to borrow money anyway. He considers this. Maybe you are right. I don't want a stupid job. I'm scared of interviews and dealing with mean co-workers and customers face to face. Using Donna's borrowed funds as an excuse to procrastinate even more, his motivation quickly evaporates. He considers making money online somehow but is quickly distracted by thoughts of inevitable failure. Donna eventually encourages him to wake up earlier and form healthier habits in the hopes he'll get his act together and finally get a job. I have some bad habits, but it's impossible to fix them. I've tried, and I just need 11 hours of sleep every night and I need video games to relax because I'm still so stressed out all the time, he claims. After several months of solidifying these life-destroying habits into his routine, he notices Donna become increasingly frustrated. Something is clearly bothering her. He assumes it's his lack of progress finding a job, but eventually she finally admits her problem. Can you help me pay Gary back? He's been asking for his money. I forgot you borrowed from that loser. How much did you borrow, he asks. Seven thousand dollars. Seven thousand? We didn't need that much. Why would you borrow so much? It's only been a few months, you must have a lot left right? Nah, we spent it all, she admits. We? There is no we here. I maybe spent one or two thousand of that, at most. I've barely been eating anything. I'm not even fat anymore and you've gotten fatter. Max shouts in disbelief. Well, I told him you could get it. Fearful Max's sense of security completely vanishes as the stress overwhelms his entire body. His legs wobble as he sits down on the couch. How could you borrow so much money and set me up as the one responsible for paying it back? We needed the money. Then I had to go to my friend's birthday parties and buy drinks and dinner with them. What am I going to do? Not celebrate and get wasted with my girlfriends, she says. A single tear drips down his face. He hides it by turning his face, but she notices his red eyes. Not when we are so close to starving, he mumbles. She watches her own lip curl slightly in disgust in the reflection of a mirror on the wall. The tears pour down his face now. I don't want to go back to eating cup ramen and drinking water every day. But you can still make more money, she yells. He didn't answer. Too lethargic to move from his spot, he sleeps on the couch. In the afternoon the next day, a loud knocking wakes him up. Boom, boom, boom. This was the knock of a man who didn't care who he pissed off by knocking too loudly. Boom, boom, boom. Repeated the knocker. Um, Donna can you get that? As she opens the door Max cowers behind the corner. Without saying a word, a large man covered in tattoos bursts into their living room and stares at Max without blinking. Gary. His eyes filled with anger he shouts at Maximum, your lady says you got my money, 8,000 bucks, and I better get it today. 18. Fearless Max makes a friend. Audio slaves like a stone plays over the bar's sound system. Max sits at a corner table sipping a beer alone. A man approaches and sits on a nearby stool. Noticing Max staring into an invisible abyss, he strikes up a conversation. You okay bro? Max looks up to see a muscular man wearing a red t-shirt with the words Reinvent Boxing Club across the chest. 
Managing a half smile, he replies. Not really, my business failed. I lost my website, the money I invested, and I have nothing now. I usually don't drink, I just came here to forget about being such a failure. Red t-shirt guy smiles and says. That's life bro. You can't always win. Failure is tough, but it makes you stronger. Max considers how to respond. After a few seconds he says. Logically I get that, but it's frustrating to have all these goals, but to never have any way of achieving them. I tried to work a few years to save money, but I could barely save any. Then when I tried to start my own business, I barely survived a year before everything collapsed and now I'm back at nothing. Well I wish good luck to everyone that was on your team then, he responds, reaching over to shake hands. I'm Julian. Maximum. Actually I was running the business on my own, he replies. It can be almost impossible to get a lot done by yourself though, must have been hard, Julian says while nodding. Yeah, maybe you are right. I just always wanted to be completely independent. Sorry to ruin your obvious good mood with negativity. I usually hate complaining, especially to people I don't know. Julian laughs. That's impossible. My good mood comes from my decision to feel good. I don't need people constantly smiling at me for positive emotions. At that moment, Max notices the cup in Julian's hand. Do you always drink water at the bar? Julian smiles again. It's good water. Pausing a moment, he continues. I can be social and myself no matter what I'm drinking. Max instantly realizes how rare this perspective is. I bet everyone gives you shit for that. Oh yeah. It's a huge challenge to their fragile egos. They can't contemplate the possibility that they could relax and socialize without alcohol. Most normal people really don't care, but some attack anyone who doesn't need it. But like I said, I don't need their opinions to feel good about myself. Max glances down at his own beer. Feeling a bit self-conscious about his decision to consume alcohol tonight, he reluctantly takes another sip. How do you do that? How do you live so independently of other people's opinions and the inevitable challenges life throws at you? Julian looks Max in the eyes. The first step is to accept adversity as a fact. If you constantly resist it life only gets more painful. Next, convince yourself it's a positive. Like the first few days you go to the gym, it will be painful, and you get sore. But if you go every day for a few months you adapt and convince yourself to enjoy that feeling of growth. The pain disappears. Why can't I just feel good all the time though, he replies, while breaking eye contact to look at a cute girl across the bar. If you felt good a majority of your life, you would only end up weak. The tiniest annoyance would shatter your good mood. After you've been through hardcore adversity you just laugh at the petty crap that bothers most people. Yesterday, I saw a guy go nuts when a sharp corner on a table ripped his shirt. His face turned red in rage and he was spitting obscenities at the manager of the place. If it was me I'd just buy a new shirt and move on. Managing a smirk, Max clears his throat to respond. I get what you mean, but I didn't ruin my favorite shirt. My business failed, my rent is late, and I'm broke. I think I've earned the right to feel devastated and depressed in this situation. You are free to feel however you want, but choosing to feel like crap will only attract more crappy situations. So, what kind of business was it? Julian asks with genuine interest. I tried to do some freelance graphic design and photography, but I made some bad decisions and lost all my money. 
I had to sell my cameras to survive the last two months and I don't have money to pay for my expenses. That was my dream. Now I have nothing, he said smiling, to avoid sounding whiny. Keep your options open. I know a guy who got rich selling dog clothes. He thinks people who put clothes on dogs are idiots. It's not his passion, but he makes enough money to do whatever he wants now. That's a good point. Any suggestions? Julian takes a drink of water and nods his head. Yeah, there are lots of things you can do. I'm starting a software automation company. We make programs that help businesses save time and money. If you know web design and any programming languages like Python maybe we can give you a chance. Max's eyes light up. I actually do know Python and a few web development related languages. Cool. In that case you can come meet my team if you have time tomorrow. We are having lunch near here. Max's anxiety suddenly increases. He feels pressured to accept the invitation, but at the same time hopes the opportunity can solve all his problems. He hesitates a few moments then admits. I don't know if I should go. I'm not really in the mood to impress anyone. That's what I would find impressive though. If you can keep fighting for success and dive into the next challenge no matter how you feel, then I know you're less likely to give up. I don't like giving people opportunities when they are in a good mood. I never know how unpredictable they will be when something goes wrong in their lives. The pressure increases. If I don't go I might lose this chance. If I go, I'll feel awkward but at least I'll have experience facing adversity instead of letting it overwhelm me. Okay, I'll go, he finally decides. 19. Fearful Max destroys the world. His face is bruised and his lower lip drips blood from where Gary hit him. He curls up into a ball on the floor as Gary kicks him in the back. It reminds him of every other time he froze in fear in the past. The memories trigger even more panic. His body shakes in terror. He tries to shout, stop, but the syllable dies of dread in his throat, finally, Gary stops kicking. I told you. Get me my money and I'll leave. Adrenaline fires through Max's body. It shouts at him to fight back. Instead, he continues to tremble and struggles to stutter a response, D. D. Donna. Borrowed it, he stutters. You gonna blame this on your girl? No bro. This is on you. You use the money she borrowed. And you are a man, you have more responsibility. At this point, Donna finally enters the conversation. Come on Max, I told him you have his money. Just give it to him. The fear shifts to deep regret. I knew I shouldn't have let her borrow from this freak. B, B, but then I'll have nothing. Better broke than dead. Gary shouts into Max's face to intimidate him. Breaking eye contact, Max looks down and lets out a shaky sigh. I need to go to the ATM downstairs. Let's go, barks Gary. The three march down to the ATM where Max withdraws $2,500 and hands it to Gary. This is all I have now. I didn't know she borrowed so much. The panic in Max's chest intensifies as he observes Gary's angry expression. He'll probably kill me for not having enough, then I'll be both broke and dead. I'll be back for the rest in two weeks. Relieved to escape with his life Max manages to mumble a response, okay, while intentionally avoiding Gary's violent stare and sitting down on a nearby bench as he can barely stand. Gary smiles and looks at Donna. You hungry Donna? I recently came into some cash, I'll take you out to eat at a nice barbecue place I know. 
Without hesitating, she walks up to Gary then looks at Max sitting limp on the bench. She says nothing but rolls her eyes. Gary puts his arm around her and they walk off to his car. They get in and drive away, tears run down his face. Damn. What a bitch, he whispers to himself after pulling out his inhaler and taking several deep inhalations. After his breathing returns to normal, he limps back to his room defeated. Over the next few days he barely sleeps. He lays in bed all day with his laptop. Mostly in the same position as he wastes time watching fail videos on YouTube. He never laughs. He simply distracts himself from what he feels is inevitable starvation. Can't believe I lost all my money. Can't believe Donna left me. I have to get more money to pay back Gary or I'm dead. Every pessimistic thought results in another hour of time wasted by ignoring it with TV or online games. This only succeeds in reinforcing the belief that he should run from his problems. He reaches his hands into his hair and pulls at the knotted mess on his head. The weight of depression increases in his chest and throat. Carrying this heavy burden exhausts him. Eventually, he decides to get some fresh air. He puts on a jacket and walks outside with only a small amount of cash left. The cool air irritates him even more. He considers returning home to sleep more. No. I need alcohol. After a 15 minute walk, he arrives at a nearby bar. He orders two beers and sits in a corner alone. He quickly finishes both while staring into empty space. Without thinking he orders another. You okay bro, asks a man in a red shirt with the words, reinvent boxing club, on it. Annoyed at the intrusion into his miserable solitude, he continues staring into his glass of beer to avoid eye contact. Yeah. I'm fine, he replies, hoping the unwanted social interaction disappears. You don't look fine, the man observes. Fearful Max feels stress elevate gradually as he continues to sulk in silence longer than socially appropriate. I'm fine, he finally mumbles at a barely audible volume that indicates he doesn't believe it. In the same breath he turns his back to the intruder and drinks in silence. The man in the red shirt nods and responds again. Good luck with whatever is bothering you, he walks away to start a conversation with a nearby girl. Relieved of the pressure to socialize, fearful Max returns to his habit of cycling through unproductive, negative thoughts. Screw that condescending jerk. I don't need his help or pity. I just want to be left alone. I just want to be free. But everyone is always trying to take things away from me. After he finishes his beer, he looks around and observes everyone chatting happily. Why I don't I have as much reason to be happy as these people? Why am I so afraid to talk to people? Nobody cares about what I have to say, there is no point in honestly sharing what I'm going through with anyone. Scenes of social fun reminding him only of his own inadequacies, he decides to leave. He walks slowly with his eyes aimed at the ground. After entering a convenience store he purchases the largest can of coffee he can find. Outside he drinks it as fast as he can. Tastes like crap, he thinks. He takes in the silence around him. Looking up, he sees a clear sky and a few twinkling stars. For the first time in many days, he takes a deep, slow breath. As he exhales, he closes his eyes and spontaneously imagines all his pain leaving with it. He opens his eyes when he hears someone playing piano. Where is that coming from? He wonders. Following the sound, he eventually finds himself in the middle of a large park. The trees around him sway with a light breeze. How can someone be playing piano in a park? 
he feels dizzy and light-headed. He lays down on a long wooden bench and closes his eyes. I have so much potential. If only people knew how awesome I am. I wish I was confident. I wish I wasn't afraid to talk to people. A heavy warmth builds in his chest. What is this? I've never felt this before. Touching his face, he realizes he is crying. Not exactly tears of sadness. A sense of joy he never felt before also builds inside him. What is this? he wonders out loud. Feeling even lighter headed, he takes off his jacket and folds it. After placing it under his head, he closes his eyes and turns on his side. Intoxicating sensations comfort him. For the first time in a long while, a smile forms on his face. Wow, what was in that coffee? A few seconds later, he is asleep. 20. Fearless Max and the Superhuman Mindset Max raises an eyebrow. Really? I've never thought of that. Of course. With an abundance mindset you feel safe and comfortable to occasionally take risks. The average poor person is living in scarcity so fears any risk that could destabilize the tiny bit of value they've managed to accumulate. Max's eyes widen as he makes a connection with his own experience. Maybe you are kind of right. Many people I've known waste years doing the same low-income jobs out of fear of failing at anything riskier. I at least took the risk of starting my own business, but I failed. So, it actually doesn't help me build that abundance mindset. That's where you're dead wrong. That fearless abundance mentality doesn't just come from having plenty of cash in your pockets. It comes from facing your fears and learning from setbacks. Just like you did. People with a scarcity mindset would be too terrified to even attempt that. Now you are ready for whatever the next challenge is. I do feel braver than before, but I'm not sure I have an abundance mindset yet, Max admits. That might be a good thing. It's best to earn it. Earn it? Max asks. Yeah, you know 70% of lottery winners end up bankrupt in a few years. They suddenly feel invincible and can't handle it. So, I just need more failure. Max asks incredulously. More adversity. Face more fears. Make more mistakes. Flex your confidence and abundance muscles and eventually you'll build a foundation strong enough to support a superhuman mindset. 21. Fearful Max and the Superhuman Mindset Max wakes up to a loud buzzing sound. He immediately sits up and shouts. Where am I? No one answers. He looks around and sees it is still dark. The air seems cold, but he somehow feels warm. It's like the cold can't even touch me. He reaches into his pocket and pulls out his phone. 2 a.m.? I only slept two hours. I feel great though. The buzzing turns into piano music. There's that sound again. He stands up to investigate and takes a step. He notices something feels very strange. My feet feel lighter. It's like walking on air. He instantly bolts across the grass to test his speed. Even after reaching the edge of the park he keeps running. He feels his lungs working hard but doesn't feel exhausted. After stopping less than a minute to let them catch up to his newfound invincible spirit, he continues running. Now surrounded by apartment buildings and parking lots, he slows his pace. In front of someone's yard, he sees it. A punching bag, he whispers to himself. For the first time in his life, he feels a new emotion. Warm energy gushes out of the center of his chest like a powerful geezer. 
He places a hand on the warmth and smiles. He wonders out loud. Is this happiness? I never realized it was possible to feel this good. Approaching the punching bag brings back memories of his own practice. Followed by images of his high school bullies who took advantage of his weak attitude to build their own sense of dominance. The bag morphs into the faces of all the people who ever crushed his spirit. The psychopath, Scott, Donna, his father, the joy in his heart gives way to a wave of rage. His fists raise to the sides of his face. He throws jabs, hooks, and crosses repeatedly. The faces of his enemies flatten with each strike. Die, he shouts. Get out of my life. After another barrage of strikes his knuckles turn red. Sweat drips from his forehead. And then he sees him, Scott. Standing in front of a thick pine tree. Max launches his fist into his nemesis, knocking him out cold. At least, that is what he saw happen. Momentarily, he is confused when he sees the imagery shift in front of him. Instead of Scott lying unconscious, he only sees his fist connecting with the musty bark of the pine tree. Bringing the knuckles up to his face he sees they are bleeding, but he feels no pain. Am I invincible, he wonders out loud. Hey what the hell are you doing? Get out of my yard, shouts a loud voice behind him. Turning to look, Max sees a tall, balding man. Dad? He wonders for a moment. You aren't my dad. Don't tell me what to do, he shouts in a booming voice. Damn that was loud, I didn't know I could yell that loud. He realizes. Get the hell off my property. I'm calling the cops, shouts the old man, almost as loud, as veins pop in his neck, his eyes bulge, and his face turns red. The words bounce right off Max's mysterious sense of invincibility without leaving a mark. Stand up for yourself jerk, he says casually in a deep voice, before turning and walking away. The old man squints and says nothing, then waddles back inside his home. Max walks down the street while enjoying an unexplainable bliss. A stream of barely connected thoughts surge into his awareness. What is this feeling? Am I superhuman now? It's like I've completely shared my cowardly habits. How is this possible? Am I dead? He sprints home without stopping to rest. Inside he feels too energetic to sit down. Suddenly, he remembers he needs to get money to pay back Gary. Maybe if I get the money, Donna will come back to me. He hopes. Okay. I have to figure out how to get a bunch of money, he says loudly to himself while pacing around his room. Maybe I should finally find a job. He sits down at his computer and searches for jobs in his area. He finds various companies in need of graphic design work, managers, and various consultants. In the past, he believed his creative skills weren't good enough to be accepted by any employer. That's why he didn't even try to look for a real job. But now, booming with confidence, he felt finding any job would be easy. Over the next few hours he crafts three versions of his resume depending on the type of job then sends them out to as many potential employers as he can find. When that is finished, he looks around his messy apartment and frowns. He grabs a large black garbage bag from a shelf and opens it. Then bends down to fill with piles of trash from around the house. Discarded soda cans, receipts, and moldy fast food containers soon fill the bag and he needs to continue with a new bag. He vacuums, scrubs the walls with soap, cleans the refrigerator, and wipes dust from every spot he can find. After filling three trash bags he takes them outside to toss into the dumpster. Returning home, 
he sits down and looks around. I didn't realize it was that dirty inside, he says to himself. A flood of thoughts pour into his consciousness. The filth inside me is just like the mess in the house. I've let it pile up because it's easier to ignore than to clean it up. But after cleaning I feel a lot more comfortable. Now that I've cleansed my soul I am pure. I am finally human. I finally feel free. There was dirt blocking my ability to express myself. It clogged my lungs. Whenever I tried to speak it felt like the universe was shoveling another boulder into my throat and I couldn't get out the slightest sound. I let the filth of negativity and fear control my behavior. All these thoughts spin through his mind in a matter of seconds. Thoughts materialize with such speed, he actually feels the connections igniting in his brain as their momentum causes minor shifts inside his head. The thoughts continue. I haven't been myself. I finally have a chance to live. He walks outside and goes to a nearby grocery store. Strolling through the aisles he walks by the high-calorie snacks he usually loves. Potato chips, soda, candy, licorice. It all seems so disgusting now. I need some fresh vegetables. Arriving at the appropriate aisle, the smell of produce triggers more positive thoughts. If I want to be alive, I need invigorating fresh vegetables to feel alive myself. I need to cut out everything that's hurting my life. He pulls out his smartphone and deletes every unnecessary app. Games he spent hundreds of hours on deleted in just a few seconds. He smiles as he places the phone back in his pocket. I'll probably get a lot more done now, he realizes. The next moment he carefully chooses a bag of apples and takes them to the cash register. How are you doing today? The girl working the register asks. Great thanks, he says with a smile and strong eye contact. And, how are you? She smiles. Not bad. You seem like you're in a good mood. Most people don't even make eye contact with me. His smile widens. Yeah, I am in a good mood. People should show more appreciation for your work. You sell your time making sure people get the stuff they need. She laughs. I'm just a cashier. That'll be two dollars. He hands over the cash. Thanks. Walking out of the store he feels his good mood elevate even more. The sensation of energy swirling through his chest makes him feel almost weightless. That was nice. I usually hate talking to cashiers. He takes a bite of a large green apple. This is probably the best apple I've ever tasted. A buzzing sound erupts from his pocket. For a moment he thinks the phantom piano music has returned. When he realizes it's his phone he pulls it out and answers. Hello. Hi, I'm looking for Max, the voice says. That's me, Max says cheerfully. Hi, this is Wilson Sloan with Vortex Consulting. You recently applied for a job as a web developer and we would like to invite you in for an interview. Would you have time any day this week? I have time tomorrow, Max instantly says without thinking. Sure, how is 3 p.m.? No problem, Max answers. Okay, we will send you some more information by email. See you soon. Max hangs up the phone. A wide smile brightens his face. Finally, some good luck for a change, he says out loud. I'm going to get that job, pay my debts, get Donna back and finally take martial arts lessons. After a long walk around town, he eventually returns home. At midnight, he takes a shower, and goes to bed. But instead of sleeping, his mind is still racing. What is going on? 
why wasn't I afraid to talk to that cashier? Usually I'm so shy in public interactions. Maybe this is a dream. It feels like I've always been dreaming my whole life, but I've finally woken up. Several hours pass, but his eyes remain open. He feels like a battery filled with more energy than it was designed to hold. 5 a.m.? Has time slowed down? Is time even real? And then a thought enters his mind, but Max senses that it is not his own thought, but a thought sent to him. It feels as if someone is typing the message in his mind, you must love the world. Love the world? How can I possibly love everyone no matter what? He wonders. The typing voice in his mind provides no answers. Yes, I do want to love everyone. But some people are so unlovable. Perhaps that is the challenge. They are supposed to present themselves as unlovable monsters so that I can practice loving them unconditionally. Why would I need to go through training like that? This is torture, and then a conclusion that seems reasonable at the time takes root. Maybe I'm a god. I mean, I feel like a god. I feel completely invincible. I'm fearless. In fact, I could probably jump off a building without fearing the fall. Don't do that, he suddenly hears someone shout outside. Wow, is someone reading my mind? That's kinda creepy. I don't know if I'm a god or not but okay whoever is reading my mind I won't jump off a building or do anything dumb. I'm just trying to figure out what's going on. A strange feeling shakes his entire body. He sits up and looks at the clock. It's already 7 a.m. I didn't sleep but I feel great. I have an interview this afternoon. I better get ready. He takes a shower and puts on a cheap, long sleeve button shirt, pants, a leather belt, and his only pair of black shoes, but then realizes a problem. Damn. I don't have any ties. I won't look professional enough. I also don't have enough money to buy a tie. I'll figure something out. He walks outside and considers shoplifting a tie for a moment. I don't want to do anything bad, I just want to look professional, he decides. An explosion of thought suddenly erupts into his awareness. Everyone is your friend. Ask for help and you will receive it. Max isn't sure if it's his own thought or not. He walks to a neighbor's door and knocks. A retired gentleman Max often sees around the apartment complex but never speaks to answers. Hello, he asks, wondering who could be at his door so early in the morning. Smiling, Max asks. I'm sorry to bother you this morning but I was wondering if I could borrow a tie because I have an interview today and I don't have one. Sorry if it's kind of a weird request since I don't know you but I'm not sure what to do right now. The old man laughs. Oh, I don't mind, I think I have an old tie in here somewhere. Just wait a minute. Sure, I appreciate it, Max says gratefully. After a few moments of waiting the old man returns to the door with a large red tie. It's clearly used, but... Still in good condition. As he hands it over he says. Don't bother returning it. I'm actually happy someone can get some use from it one more time. I hope you get the job. Thank you so much. Have a good day, the old man says and then shuts the door. Max walks away feeling invigorated by the victory over a minor challenge and the friendly interaction. After tying the tie around his neck, he runs outside. With his eyes closed he enjoys the light of the sun hitting his skin. It feels like electricity speeding through his body. And again, the voices return. The fear you invested in has melted away from your mind, 
allowing it to hatch into reality. The thoughts express exactly what he feels. I must show the world my potential. I could defeat a bear in hand-to-hand -hand combat. He starts to sprint to the path that leads to the forest in search of a bear, but another thought explosion interrupts this plan. No. Go to the interview first. It's important to get this job so you have enough money to start the projects you need to save the earth from evil. He stops for a moment and scans the path that leads to the mountains full of bears. I don't want to kill a bear after all. I want to tame it. I want to tame all beasts. Bears, lions, dogs. I'll be able to walk with them without being harmed. They'll sense my peacefulness and follow me. He turns around and looks back at the city. I need to go to that interview though. Like the voice is saying. I need resources if I'm going to build my empire and finally love the world instead of running from it. After walking back into town, he catches a bus to the offices where his interview will take place. As people get on and off he smiles and tries to make eye contact. Some people smile, but most avoid eye contact. Max hears people speaking but can't quite make out the words. That must be people's thoughts, he thinks. He listens carefully but still can't focus enough to understand more than a word or two. Then he hears an odd announcement on the bus radio speaker. This bus is a simulation. You can do anything you want here. Throw things. Hit people. Even sing and dance. And then silence. Max looks around and sees that everyone else is just sitting and minding their own business or playing with their phones. He feels the urge to stand up and dance, but something seems strange to him. He turns to the women sitting nearby and asks. Is this a magic bus? She looks up and smiles, not sure if he is joking or means something different. Well, I hope it's a magic bus that can get me to work on time, I'm already late. A voice in his mind warns him, don't talk to people about these thoughts. They aren't ready for them yet. Oh, I'm just joking, he replies quickly. What's your job? You seem fashionable I guess you sell clothes or something like that. Wow you're a good guesser. I just started a job at a store in the downtown mall. It's not really my style, mostly business clothes though. I might need some new business clothes. I'm going to an interview now. I borrowed this tie from a neighbor this morning, he says lifting up the tie to show it off. Good luck. I'm Jessica, she says, while extending a hand for a handshake. Max, he replies while giving her hand a firm squeeze. You have a really confident handshake for a girl. Usually girls give me a handshake and it's like holding a live squid. She laughs. Oh yeah my dad taught me how to give a proper handshake. Well, I get off at this stop. Hey, here is my card, you can look up my name and contact me sometime. You are funny. He takes her card and watches her exit the bus. He feels warmth and happiness fill his chest again. Did I just get a girl's number? I never thought that would ever be possible. I wonder how many girls I could meet if I talked to more every day. The happiness is countered by another thought explosion. Charisma comes from selfless compassion. It comes from not caring what she thinks of me. If I kept worrying that girl will think I'm ugly then I wouldn't have been able to say exactly what I wanted to say to her. If I stop loving everyone and just pursue my own selfish desires, then I can't help the world grow. Looking out the window Max sees the tall office building he was looking for and gets off the bus. After checking the time, he realizes he is a little early. He decides to go inside anyway. The lobby is impeccable. 
The room is completely white except for a large mural of the company logo for Vortex Consulting and mostly red wall art. He approaches the receptionist. Hi, I'm here for an interview. Max? Yes, that's me, he says with a bright smile the receptionist mimics politely. Just a moment, she replies and then calls to let the interview know Max has arrived. Mr. Wilcox will see you now. Please step into his office over there, she states as she points toward the office door. Thank you, he replies. He walks in and sees a man in a suit and tie sitting at a large desk. Hi, I'm Max, he says while exuding confidence. I'm Jack Wilcox. I'll be interviewing you today, the man says, while reaching for a handshake. Nice to meet you, Max says making strong eye contact, a firm shake, and a wide smile. Please have a seat. Max sits down. So how are you doing today? Mr. Wilcox asks. I feel great. How about you? Not bad. I hope you don't mind if we jump into the questions I'm supposed to ask, Mr. Wilcox says. Not at all, Max admits, truthfully. So, tell me about yourself. Okay, I'll be honest. I've always been interested in doing creative things. So, I studied graphic design in university. I've also been interested in business and marketing, so I tried to make my own business designing marketing materials for clients and that was a great experience. I really learned a lot. Yes, I saw that in your resume. Why not continue doing that? Wilcox asks. I think I missed being part of a team. I also realized I need more experience before I can be successful on my own, Max says. Mr. Wilcox listens and smiles as he hears Max answer. What are your goals in five years? In five years I want to learn a lot more skills in design, marketing, business, and be a lot more successful than I am now. For the next five years I want to focus on my career and improve myself as much as possible. The words come out confidently as Max holds strong eye contact conveying intense sincerity. I can tell you are serious about that. Some of our projects have short deadlines and it can be stressful. How well do you handle stress? To be honest that really depends. When I know I can get something finished I see the stress as motivation and I often do great work when I have to do it quickly. Such as in university writing essays or completing homework projects when I only have a few days to complete them, or sometimes clients wanted a rush job and I've done well because I can feel a kick of adrenaline from being forced into action, explains Max. That's good to hear, Mr. Wilcox responds. So how proficient are you with Illustrator, Photoshop, and InDesign? I've used them all since I was in high school. I've taken a few. Max starts to respond, but then he sees something. A giant crab crawling on the wall and wearing a shiny purple top hat. Pretend you don't see the crab. Don't mess up this interview, shouts a voice in his mind. Classes, so I mostly know how to use them. Mr. Wilcox asks more questions about Max's proficiency in web development related skills such as HTML and CSS. Max quickly demonstrates his expertise with thorough answers. The conversation seems to go well, but every few minutes another crab appears on the wall. Max struggles to follow the advice of the voice in his mind. He tries to ignore the strange visual, but it's very distracting. Well Max, you might be the right person for this job. When can you start? As soon as possible, Max replies. Suddenly Max's attention is distracted by the sound of claws tapping on the hardwood floor behind him. Great, 
Can you come in Monday next week to sign a contract and some other paperwork? Mr. Wilcox asks. A nervous feeling starts to build in Max's gut. He turns to the right to get a view of whatever is making the noise. Sorry, what did you ask? He asks, turning back to the interview. Mr. Wilcox squints and wonders if he needs to speak louder. I asked if you have time on Monday next week to come back and discuss a contract. Max takes another peek behind his shoulder and sees it this time. A large monster with the head of a lion crouching in the corner. Drool drips down its exposed jaws as it growls. Its hairy ears twitch. Unblinking reddish-brown eyes stare back at Maximum, pretend it isn't here. Pretend it isn't here. We almost got the job. Shouts the voice in his mind. Um, yeah. I, I, think I have time Monday, he whispers while still staring into the corner of the room. Okay how about 3 p.m., asks Mr. Wilcox, but a second voice shouts loudly into Max's consciousness. I will devour you. The invincible confidence drains from his body. His hands tighten into fists and sweat drips down his face and back. Pretend it isn't there, shouts the protective voice. Yeah, that, that will be fine. Is everything okay? What are you looking at over there? asks Mr. Wilcox while raising an eyebrow. The beast stands on its hind legs and takes two steps closer. It bends down until its face is inches from maximum. Its nostrils flare as it breathes. Max smells the stench of rotting meat and filth on its breath. It's so nauseating he almost throws up. Its mouth opens, and Max hears a voice that sounds more like barking dog than a person. I will devour you because you deserve to be devoured. You've given up your life, so now it is mine, shrieks the booming voice in his head. Max's heart beats so loudly he can hear it. His hands shake. Yeah, sure. Okay. So, see you Monday? Mr. Wilcox asks. Before he can answer, the beast lunges at Max's face. 22. Fearless Max learns to fight. I feel less scared of physical confrontation than when I started sparring here, but how do I keep from flinching when you guys are trying to hit me? Max asks. Julian removes a boxing glove and with a free hand uses it to take out his mouth guard. Fear and anxiety cause the flinch. Without fear, you won't flinch at all, but that would be dangerous. Sparring is the best way to mentally prepare yourself for confrontations. Nobody here is going to hit you hard enough to knock you out. I want to spar more, but is there any way to at least diminish that fear? Because it's really annoying sometimes. Even though I know getting hit here won't kill me I instinctually want to close my eyes and run instead of fighting back with the skills I've learned the past couple years training here with you guys. Real courage comes from facing fear, especially when you don't feel like it, Julian replies. So, don't resist getting hit. I'm worried that would become a dangerous habit in an actual fight, Max suggests. It's also a habit that could save your life. With your eyes open you can react faster because instead of focusing on avoiding pain you are focused on taking the best action possible. Open yourself up to that possibility and see what happens. Okay, I'll work on it. You better work on it a lot more if you want to beat Marcus in the state championship in a couple months. He knocks people out all the time. Julian says as he reinserts his mouth guard and straps on his boxing gloves. Let's do another round. Max feels slightly nervous, as he remembers watching a video of Marcus Hunter knock out another boxer with an uppercut in the second round of an amateur match. He raises his hands up next to his face. It's scary, 
but I'm determined to face all my fears. He thinks calmly, before jabbing at his opponent. Julian steps outside of the strike. He then double jabs and throws a hook that lands hard at Max's temple. Keep your hands up, Julian instructs. Max dives in with a jab, a cross and a hook, followed by more jabs and hooks. Each strike almost makes contact. But each time Julian either blocks or steps out of the way, Julian lunges in with a straight right cross aimed at Max's nose. Instead of panic, Max feels calm and ready. He keeps his eyes open to pay attention to the incoming strike. Stepping out of the line of attack, Max lowers his right fist and delivers a fast uppercut under Julian's chin, rocking back his head. Max pushes forward with more strikes. Julian retreats to avoid getting hit then comes back into counter-attack. Some land. Others, Max dodges or counters. A buzzer sounds letting them know the round has finished. Max removes his gloves and grabs a drink from his water bottle. His shirt is drenched in sweat. You had some good counters there. You might almost be ready for that fight, Julian says. Pleased with the praise, Max still feels a twinge of nervousness as the thinks about the upcoming fight. 23. Fearful Max gives up. Max's entire body is consumed by fear. He leaps out of his chair and hides under a table. Don't kill me. Please, he screams. What the hell is the matter with you? Mr. Wilcox demands angrily as he stands up at his desk. The beast claws at Max under the table. Tears pour down Max's face as he begs for mercy. No. Don't eat me I want to live. I want to love the world. Let me have another chance. Is this some sort of prank? Get the hell out of my office and never come back, demands Mr. Wilcox. The beast bites Max's arm and tries to pull him out from under the table. Pain spreads like fire from his arm up to his shoulder. Max leans back to prevent the beast from dragging him across the floor. Don't touch me! Mr. Wilcox walks out of the office and shuts the door behind him. His secretary and several other co-workers are already standing outside the door wondering what is going on. Jennifer called the cops, Mr. Wilcox demands. This guy is on drugs or something. The beast bites down harder on Max's arm and yanks hard. He suddenly finds himself in the middle of the room with his back to the floor. The beast releases his arm and stares into his eyes without blinking. It speaks again, but this time not as a voice in his mind. I am real. I am more real than you. You are a fake persona. A mask hiding nothing beneath it. Max's whole body shakes nervously. No. I, I am more than nothing. I am a god. I felt invincible just a few hours ago. This must be a test. The beast's drool drizzles onto Max's face as it laughs. You are no god. You are a maggot that stumbled onto a doorway that unleashes horrors far worse than me. True gods don't need to feel invincible to be invincible, you disgusting worm. Max closes his eyes to avoid the unblinking stare of the beast. A warm, rotten stench continues to belch onto his face. You can't hide from me. I always watch you. Your choices are poison. You make me sick. I have come to end my suffering. A painful sensation explodes in Max's chest. He opens his eyes and sees the beast's claws pressing down on his body. Its jaws stretched open around his throat. Fine. Kill me. I never enjoyed a single moment of this life anyway. That's your fault maggot. As the beast bites down Max feels the fangs reach his spine. 
a dozen hands grab Max and flip him on his stomach. His arms twist and bend as the police struggle to place a pair of cuffs on his wrists. Their knees press into his back, making it difficult to breathe. Max's body feels paralyzed. He tries to move his arms but gives up. Am I dying? I must be dead. These are the angels and demons come to take me to be punished for wasting my life. Police drag him out of the office and into a car parked out front. They secure him in the backseat and drive away. Max tries to move his arms and legs but finds it impossible. Please don't kill me. He closes his eyes and tries to keep them closed. The police ignore him and continue driving. Eventually they arrive at a small police station. Max is dragged inside and thrown into a tiny room. Police strip his clothes down to his underwear. An officer sits in a chair outside the room and observes him through the transparent wall and door. In the room is only a filthy mattress and blanket. A sense of relief fills Maximum. He suddenly feels like he has just woken up from a dream. It's as if his entire life was an act and he was only pretending because he wasn't aware of the true nature of reality. He lays down on the floor. With his eyes still closed, he addresses the people he believes are observing him. That was great guys. Good try getting me to go through such a crappy life. Come on it was so fake and obvious. But I've escaped. I figured out the plan so let me out. Nothing happens. He hears voices. The sound is coming from far away, so he can't hear clearly. Slowly, he opens his eyes and realizes something is wrong. The heightened sense of awareness continues, but he is trapped in some kind of cell. Suddenly he feels afraid. He stands up and walks to the transparent door. He punches the thick plastic so hard the entire wall shakes. Why am I in here? He attacks the door again. A cop walks over and yells at him. Hey, stop that. Max immediately stops. I know why I'm in this box. I'm too dangerous. My fists could blow up the world. I'm so sorry, he yells. Fear sinks in as he realizes he may be stuck here forever. He sits in a corner. I finally figure out life and end up locked up in a box. I am a god with unlimited potential. But I squandered that potential and the beast found me and sent me here to be locked up forever. He paces inside the small box. He screams, sings, and cries. Holding his breath and demanding to be released don't work. Time slows down. He feels like he's been locked inside the box for centuries. Everyone was right. I should have listened to Jason. I should have paid attention to good advice friends gave me. Instead I let fear prevent me from growing. Tears roll down his face again. But it's just a show. A demonstration of the potential I abandoned a long time ago. I could be successful and happy now, but I didn't go places where I thought people would judge me. I tried to seem perfect and it made me perfectly boring and miserable, he whimpers out loud. He presses his face to the transparent wall and yells out realizations as they come to him. I made stupid excuses. I knew it was all lies. I should have talked to people I wanted to meet. I should have done everything I wanted to do but was too afraid to take action. The door of his cell swings open. For cops grab his arms and legs and carry him into the hallway where he is strapped to a stretcher. Three men in white clothes tighten the ropes around his arms and legs, Max panics again. This is it. It's all over. 24. Fearless Max Fights Max tightens the black cloth wrapped around his hands. 
I know you'll kick his ass, but please don't get hurt, says Natasha. I'll be fine. The first few rounds might be scary though. Marcus likes to punch like crazy at first. He's taken out some good boxers in the first couple rounds, but my coach says I should wait for him to tire himself out, then go after him, Max explains. Aren't you scared? He smiles, then takes a deep, slow breath in through his nose and slowly exhales before responding. I'm more scared of embarrassing myself in front of all those people in the audience than getting hurt, but I also think fear is an opportunity to grow. If I never faced my fears I don't want to know what kind of hell I would find myself in now. She still felt worried. I'm sure I'm more scared than you are, how can you be so calm? Don't worry, he assures her. Anyway, you should probably get back to your seat. My fight is starting soon. She embraces him with a quick hug and kiss before walking out to find the seats near the ring with his boxing buddies, and two of her friends who also came to spectate. In truth, he wasn't as calm as he appeared. His adrenal glands were beginning to leak adrenaline into his bloodstream in anticipation of the fight. He felt highly alert but also a little nervous. Stretching on the floor, he remembers signing up for this competition. He debated with himself for several days over joining or not. The more intense sparring sessions of the advanced classes were challenging. His sparring partners tested the limits of his endurance. But they weren't as scary as facing off with an opponent intent on knocking him out rather than just practicing for it. After all, What's the point of learning to fight if he never proves to himself that he can? He finally decided it was important for his growth to overcome his fear of physical confrontation. Even though it was uncomfortable to risk failure and pain, it would be worth it. He trained several hours daily and even ran five miles every day to maximize his endurance. After all, fatigue makes everyone a coward, as his coach likes to say. Eventually it's time to enter the ring. He steps onto the padded canvas and sees his opponent in the other corner bouncing around with light shadow boxing. A light flutter of anxiety fills Max's chest as he sees the conditioned athlete he is about to battle. Marcus' thick neck could probably withstand a punch from a gorilla, he thinks. He glues his eyes on Marcus, attempting to intimidate him even though the eye contact makes him a little nervous. In the blue corner, Marcus Hunter from Hercules Gym, the announcer yells over a speaker. Marcus raises his arms in the air and nods his head. Spectators applaud. When introduced, Max raises his own arms in the air and smiles. The audience doesn't offer as enthusiastic applause this time. However, from one side of the room he hears his friends and girlfriend cheer his name. Max also notices Marcus throwing an angry, emotionless stare in his direction. The mixture of nerves and excitement intensifies. He returns the stare. If looks could kill I'd already be dead. It's okay the spectators already like him. I only need the approval of the people I care about anyway. I can do this. His mind goes blank like a mirror reflecting reality as the referee explains the rules. The words are a blur until the referee shouts permission to fight. Both fighters approach the center of the ring. Their hands extend for a fraction of a second as they tap gloves. Then, Marcus lashes out savagely, two strikes from each fist. Max evades by jumping back at an angle. Like a rocket, Marcus hurls himself forward to close the distance. Max tries to defend himself from the savage assault. In the audience, Natasha watches. Unable to see his face behind the flying gloves, her eyes widen. She did however hear the gloves impact on Max's face and shoulders multiple times. 
Somehow Max was still standing. She watches as the fight changes from wild strikes to clinching. Marcus struggles to free himself as Max holds on. Eventually the referee yells, break, and they are forced to separate. Max fails to maintain distance and dives into a second clinch to escape a right hook to the face. Max presses his glove into Marcus's face and when the referee calls, break, again, Max shoves his opponent's head back and jumps away. Again, Marcus assaults Max with blow after blow, forcing him to back up to the edge of the ring. The strikes rain down as Max struggles to stand. Several times he is almost rocked off balance. Natasha worries for his safety as she watches. Most of the strikes land on his gloves and shoulders. He rocks back and forth to avoid strikes packed with enough force to knock him out instantly. Occasionally, he emerges for a brief attack of his own before hiding again from Marcus's ferocious assault. Natasha hears the crowd around her excitedly shout about Max's defense and realizes he must be doing something right. The buzzer rings. The two men retreat to their corners to catch their breath. Though he knew it was only three minutes, it felt like much longer. Max sits down on the stool but keeps his eyes glued on Marcus. Squatting in front of him his coach gives him a drink of water and some advice. He's exhausted already. Let him get a little more winded this round then hit him with all you got. When he crosses his head is unguarded, watch out for your chance and go for it. Deep breaths of air fill Max's lungs. Instead of fear, Max feels a sense of calm. Before the fight he was terrified of Marcus's giant fists knocking him out in the first round. Two years ago, the idea of stepping into the ring with such a dangerous opponent seemed impossible. Training quickly exposed his weaknesses. Max needed stronger arms, and a thicker neck to both deliver and withstand strikes packed with the power to dent walls. He also needed much better endurance. After two years of almost daily training, he was a completely new person. He felt Marcus's frustration at being unable to exert his will onto reality in the first round. Max had already proven to be a much tougher challenge than anticipated. The buzzer sounds and the referee shouts for the start of round two. Max approaches. His fists raise to the sides of his face, a smirk forms on one side. An expression of elated calm in knowing he is capable of finally expressing his will over reality. Marcus lashes out suddenly, determined to be the first man to strike. His expert footwork makes up for the wild striking. Max evades most strikes, but Marcus constantly closes the distance. The distance disappears faster than Max can create it. Unable to guard his face and side at the same time, Marcus's left fist thrusts into his jaw. A jolt of pain surges through Max's head and down to his toes. For a moment, everything goes black. Somehow, he manages to raise his gloves in time to prevent an uppercut from finishing the fight right there. He intentionally ducks the next strike a fraction of a second faster than it was thrown as it barely grazes the top of Max's head. Still slightly rocked by the near knockout, Max dives into the safety of a clinch. The referee quickly breaks it up. He notices Marcus slowing down and quickly slides around the ring to avoid hits. Luckily, it seems his stamina is much better than his opponent. I guess it pays off to run every day, he thinks, and then quickly refocuses on the action. Why isn't he fighting? Natasha asks one of Max's friends from the gym sitting next to her. Probably trying to tire him out. Probably pretty tired himself. I just wish he'd knock out the other guy instead of taking all that punishment, she explains, concern filling her voice. Just as she says that, the opportunity comes. 
Max takes a step to the right and jabs, then whips his fist up to Marcus's chin. His opponent blinks rapidly as his head jerks back. The audience shouts a collective howl and applauds. The audience's reaction fills Marcus with rage. The expression on his face turns psychotic. Instantly he charges like a rabid beast. His attacks are even more furious than before, clearly intent on murdering his opponent. Exhausted and dripping sweat, Max momentarily thought the fight was over when he landed that uppercut. But suddenly Marcus found the energy to not only fight back, but also make Max question his own superb stamina. Barely able to evade and block, Max has no chance to counter the attacks. He could only persevere through the storm by ducking and occasionally resting in a clinch. Though the clinch offered a moment of rest, it also came with great danger when breaking away. The buzzer finally sounds again. Marcus was clearly much more exhausted than before. His breathing was much heavier, and his movements much slower. By now, his energy reserves must be completely empty, Max thinks. Instead of sitting, Max chooses to stand and continue the stare down. His opponent, however, avoids eye contact and focuses on his one minute of rest. He's finally tired, Max realizes. Max was exhausted himself, but instead of using the rest to recuperate, he decides to use it gain a mental edge. He smiles while shadow boxing in his side of the ring. Jumping and jogging in place to show he isn't tired and has energy to spare. Sit down and rest a little, his coach demands. I'm fine, he mumbles over his mouthpiece, as he continues. The buzzer sounds, and Marcus approaches the center of the ring much more carefully this time. Max charges with a feigned right, then left cross to Marcus' face. It clearly stings, but Marcus retaliates by blocking the next strike and delivering a lightning-fast blow to Max's liver. Pain shoots through the side of his body, but it isn't enough to make him drop. Max raises his fists to block an incoming strike and sees an opening. He strikes Marcus's side and throws three more heavy strikes aimed at his head. Marcus staggers back and drops his arms. Max pursues and launches a powerful hook that grazes the side of his opponent's face. Marcus swings wildly left and right. A strike lands on Max's chin and sends him flying to the ground. The referee bends over him and begins counting the seconds. Marcus turns to the crowd with his hands in the air. 25. Fearful Max returns. A woman in white clothes escorts Max to a door. Right in there, she instructs, before walking away. Inside, he finds a middle-aged, chubby, balding man sitting on the other side of a large oak desk. Have a seat. I just need to ask you a few questions and we might be able to release you soon. Max feels a mix of both relief and apprehension. He had been looking forward to eventually getting out, but he also made some great friends inside. He woke up every morning at 8 a.m., ate meals and meds at consistent times, played board games with the other prisoners, or read books. Then lights out and in bed by 10 p.m. Every day. The consistent schedule felt organized and vastly different from his usual life. Sure, there were some weird people inside. One guy believed all the nurses were aliens trying to eat his soul for example, but most of the inmates in his wing of the hospital were just normal people trying to recover from nervous breakdowns. So how are you feeling, the man asks. Not bad, I guess, Max responds. A good sign. It seems you get along well with the other patients. I just listen politely to some of them. I don't want to start an incident just because I don't believe in aliens as much as they do, Max answers honestly. The doctor chuckles. 
Is there any history of bipolar in your family? Not that I know of. I actually have no idea what bipolar is. Well, you had a manic episode that led to psychosis. It's common in bipolar disorder. The other extreme pole is depression. Do you often feel depressed? The doctor asks. Yeah, maybe, but I just thought it was normal to feel like crap when my life is crap. The psychiatrist types a note on his computer before continuing. Do you ever have suicidal thoughts? No. Not seriously. I'd never do that, Max answers. I've had quite a few patients with severe depression and I just have to make sure, the doctor informs him. I see. I'd like to understand my experience more. I suddenly felt completely fearless, almost godlike. I saw strange things nobody else could see. Hallucinations I guess be you. The psychiatrist holds up a hand. Let me stop you right there. How have you been sleeping the past few days? A bit annoyed, Max crosses his arms. I'm still sleeping well. Good. When you get out remember to sleep at a consistent time every night and it's important to always take your medication every day, so you don't relapse. I want you to take these for at least a year. So, I'm getting out? Max asks, hope in his voice. Your father will come pick you up next Friday. Okay. He replies. Before Max can ask more questions to satisfy his curiosity of exactly what bipolar is, the doctor shoes him out of the office. He exits and returns to the small room where he sleeps and lies down. Annoyed at the doctor's dismissal of his vivid experiences while manic, he looks forward to getting out of the hospital. However, he also worries his dad will make fun of him for ending up in a place like this. 26. Fearless Max perseveres. Pain and severe exhaustion weigh down on Max's body. He breathes heavily as he considers standing back up. He rolls to his side with his glove still pressed to the canvas. 3. The referee shouts. He looks up and sees Marcus's dominant stance. Marcus glares back and shouts at him. Stay down. You're done, bro. 4. I'm tired of being dominated and told what to do. Max shouts in his head as he stares back, still breathing heavily. 5, 6, 7, the count continues, as Max wills himself up to a crouch with one knee and gloved fist resting on the canvas. Stay down, shouts dozens of voices in the audience. Even Natasha considers joining in. However, she knows Max is not the type of man to give up easily and would keep going until it was impossible to stand. 8, 9, and on the ninth second Max springs up to his feet. Marcus hurls himself at Max intent on finally ending the fight. He launches a cross aimed straight at Max's face followed by a hook from each side. It's clearly telegraphed as Max can see him grit his teeth and look at the intended targets. For a moment, Max feels a hint of nervousness in his chest as these strikes come at him. Instead of letting the environment control his emotions, he makes a split-second decision to override the instinct to run and hide. Instead, he keeps his eyes open and glued on his opponent. The first two strikes are easily parried by Max's muscular arm and shoulder. Max successfully ducks under the third and jumps back to avoid a fourth. With his back to the ropes, Max is exhausted. They exchange more violent attacks. At one point, Marcus opens a small cut next to Max's eye. A small trail of blood drips down his face. Marcus grows increasingly frustrated. He has a nearly flawless amateur boxing record and even knocked out several men who at first glance look much tougher than Maximum. 
Yet somehow this opponent doesn't know when to quit. Panting heavily, Marcus dives in for a clinch. He grabs Max's neck and pulls him in close. Though tired himself, Max sees his opponent may be even more exhausted. Instead of trying to catch a moment of rest, he decides it's more important to prevent his opponent the slightest chance to regain energy. He quickly breaks the clinch and steps back to set up a hook. It almost makes contact, but Marcus is somehow able to duck it and dive in for another clinch attempt. His arms fatigued and heavy, don't immediately respond to the command to destroy Marcus' hideous chin. Part of him is instinctually afraid of dying from exhaustion. His body begs for rest to replenish oxygen, recover from dehydration, and let sore muscles recover from what seems like a near-death experience. It would be so easy to give in and rest in the clinch for a few seconds, or even initiate a clinch himself. Instead, he ducks below Marcus's arms. Evading to the side, he delivers a perfect uppercut with his remaining strength. Marcus stumbles backwards as Max rains a series of follow-up strikes down on Marcus's head and sides. They aren't backed by much force, but they are enough to prevent Marcus from maintaining balance. Unable to get his hands up to protect his head in time, Marcus collapses to the ground. The referee jumps between them and waves his arms. Marcus's head hits the canvas hard with a loud thud. His body shakes for a moment before ceasing all motion. Max can't even see movement in his chest indicating he is still breathing. The referee immediately puts a stop to the fight, but it is not exactly the ending Max wanted. The adrenaline begins to subside with the end of the fight, however, he is unable to calm down. He places his still gloved hands above his head and keeps looking at the fallen body of his opponent. I didn't want to win like this. I didn't want to kill him. Marcus's coaches, family, and an EMT immediately swarm the fallen man. 27. Fearful Max goes home. The pair walk to a car and get in without speaking. Max opens the passenger door and takes one last look at the hospital he stayed in for two weeks. Are you sure you didn't do any drugs? Is the first thing his father asks him as soon as he gets in the vehicle and secures his seatbelt. Annoyed, Max rolls his eyes. The doctor just told you they checked my blood. They didn't find anything like that. His father finally starts the car and drives out of the parking lot. They said they found a bunch of creatine in your blood or something like that. That isn't a drug. Then why would you suddenly go running around hallucinating and scaring the bejesus out of a bunch of folk, his father asks, not comprehending. I think I just didn't sleep at all for a few days and it made me see things and get confused, Max explains. Well, take that medicine they gave you. If you weren't taking drugs before they've got you hooked on a ton of them now. Max felt anxious about taking a handful of pills every day. He wanted to improve his life and emotional stability but wanted to do it himself instead of relying on pills. He takes a deep breath. I'll take the pills that help me sleep, even the mood stabilizers, but the antipsychotics completely kill my creativity. I can feel a block in my head preventing me from thinking how I usually do. It only happens when I take those. You're taking the pills. You messed up your brain and those pills will mess you up even more if you don't take them. Take them and slowly cut back the dosage with the help of that quack jerk if you have to, but you aren't just suddenly quitting. Don't be stupid. Max sighs. I never thought I was bipolar. I don't think I need these things, he says while holding up and shaking the bag filled with his medication. I saw a guy on TV the other day claiming to be bipolar. He said he felt sad, so he jumped off a bridge. 
He survived, so he tried again. You'd think jumping off a bridge would knock the bipolar right out of YA, his father jokes. Max laughs a little at the comment. I'm not going to jump off a bridge. You better not. I haven't seen you for a few years. Max is surprised. It almost sounds like his father missed him. Sorry I didn't call in a while. I just got busy with stuff and trying to survive. His father looks out the window and takes a turn. Well, I'm also sorry. Sorry I couldn't afford a better life for you. Max looks over at his father and realizes he is struggling to find the words to say whatever it is he is trying to say. He never heard his father apologize for anything before. The apology makes Max both relieved and uncomfortable at the same time. He sits in silence for the rest of the ride, not knowing what to say. Eventually they arrive at their destination, his childhood home. He steps out of the car and immediately notices the tattered remains of his punching bag still hanging and swaying lightly in the breeze. 28. Fearless Max vs. Freedom Max looks out at the sea from the expansive balcony connected to the conference room. Wearing a new Armani suit, he loosens the tie as it feels like a noose around his neck. He feels anxious, but not because he just gave a presentation in front of an audience of several hundred. Great speech, Julian comments as he walks up. Really? Didn't I look nervous? Nobody noticed. Nobody knows what you are feeling inside except you. Unless you make the signs of insecurity incredibly obvious, which you didn't. Anyway, some of the potential clients sitting next to me were really impressed, that's all that matters. So, good job. Max stares out into the view silently. Everything okay? asks Julian. Feeling kind of nervous actually, Max admits to his friend. Well, I'm a bit nervous about securing some of these big clients too, but we've been successful so far. Julian points out. It's not that. Then what is it? Julian asks. I'm thinking about marrying Natasha, but also worried about giving up the fun bachelor life. Bro, don't do it. She's nice but you're still young. You've barely come to party with us since you started dating her. Also, you really have to come drinking with us at night more to keep good relations with our potential clients and business connections. Most deals are done outside the office, you know, and she's preventing you from becoming a millionaire. It's more stressful for me to do all that business drinking on my own. Tension seizes Max's chest as Julian criticizes his lack of devotion to the business. Is it really his girlfriend's fault though? Okay, I'll go to more after hours events, but I'm still considering marrying her. You aren't considering marriage out of fear, are you? Fear? What is there to be afraid of? Max asks in confusion. A lot actually. I don't want to go into a misogynistic rant on all the reasons why I'll never get married, but basically. Some people just settle for fear of being alone. It's not like that though, explains Max. So, she is your ideal girl? I thought your standards were really high. They are. But I'll never meet an optimistic, humorous, supermodel fluent in five languages, with a perfect singing voice capable of discussing deep philosophical topics and a whole list of other things I'd like in the ideal girl. If I keep looking for her, I'll have lots of fun, but I'll end up alone, surmises Max, so, you are settling because you think you'll never find a girl that awesome? We've met similar girls before you know. Natasha is close enough for me and talking to her is a lot more fun than those models we met. She has a great sense of humor. 
Most girls can't or don't even try to make me laugh. I still think you should give the single life another shot. You'll have freedom. With a girlfriend she'll always worry you are talking to other girls or something like that. She'll prevent you from going out to have fun with your friends like she is already doing. Then when you are married she'll expect even more loyalty. That's why the cliché is called a ball and chain. It imprisons you, Julian explains. Thinking for a moment, Max responds. You're right. I'm afraid of giving up my freedom. Julian leans in. I'm terrified of it giving it up. I don't know how you can consider willingly giving up all the fun freedoms that come with being a man. Do you know that after getting married a man's testosterone levels can drop in half? It's like marriage is a declaration you've given up your manhood. The tension in his chest tightens. He looks Julian in the eye for a few seconds before responding. Maybe it takes some bravery to give up those freedoms. I think it also frees my time to focus on myself as I won't be trying to date lots of girls like before. Whatever man, ruin your life if you want to. I don't need a wife. I just need my goals, my money and my free time. She's an awesome person, but she'll take all your time. You'll see, Julian says before walking away to meet more potential clients. 29. Fearful Max Tries Max stumbles into the bar and orders a beer. He sits in the same place as last time. It brings back the memory of those incomprehensible events from two years ago. Every day he replays the experience in his mind. The hallucinations as vivid as reality. A familiar face just happens to spot him sitting alone. Max immediately feels anxious as the man approaches. He crosses his arms and leans back. This time, he maintains eye contact and waits to see what the guy wants. Hey, I think we met before. How's it going buddy, the familiar stranger asks. Yeah, I've come here before, I think we talked for a minute, Max admits. I vaguely remember. I'm Julian, he says, extending his right hand. As they shake hands, Max looks down to make sure he performs the action correctly. Maximum. So, what brings you out here? asks Julian. Max feels pressured to explain himself to this stranger. He looks down remembering back to the last time he came here and rudely refused to talk to the same guy, he feels guilty. Finally, he decides to explain himself. I'm just trying to figure out something that happened to me here last time. Like what? The pressure increases. I just. I had some weird hallucinations and it all started on a night I came to this bar. I had some weird hallucinations one time. Best experience of my life, Julian says before gulping down half of the beer in his hand. Max relaxes a little. The psychiatrists he talked to didn't want to hear about or interpret his hallucinations, and everyone else seemed to question his sanity if he even tried to talk about it. Maybe Julian could relate more. So, what happened in your hallucinations? Max asks. It was more like a spiritual awakening than just hallucinations. It sounds kind of pretentious, but it felt like I'd been asleep my whole life without knowing it and then boom. Suddenly I'm alert and awake. Changed my whole life. Max's eyes light up as he recognizes the similarity with his own experience. That's actually how I felt. Cool. Did you feel like you were God or something like that? Just for a few seconds, says Max, astounded by the similarities between the two men's experiences. It's interesting that so many people have these experiences, even atheists suddenly think they are a god. 
I mean that's exactly how it feels. There is no other conclusion available, so the mind says yep I'm a god now. Max nods his head and uncrosses his arms. But why did you say it changed your life? It's totally messed up mine. I embarrassed myself so badly, and now I'm hooked on antidepressants and mood stabilizers. It showed me all this suppressed fear and pain I avoided. Like I realized I still have feelings for a former girlfriend. I just pretended I didn't care about kicking her out of my life to move to a new city and start my own business. Max leans forward as he listens. So, what happened next? How come you aren't hooked on meds? I can't function without these things now. I started doing a lot of meditation and fixed a lot of my bad habits and routines. I don't need meds because I never took them. I want to determine my mood and confidence level for myself. Max sighs again and frowns. I don't think I could do that now. Well it's irresponsible to suddenly quit. Talk to your doctor if you want help slowly getting off them, Julian warns. I mean, I don't think I can determine my mood by myself. There is always some calamity knocking on my door. I can't just smile and pretend it doesn't affect me. Problems are inevitable. I expect them to come. Just recently, my business completely failed because I didn't get the right people to help me, but I'm still out having fun and trying to figure out what to do next, Julian says as he frowns a little, then finishes his beer. Max raises a skeptical eyebrow. So, you just suddenly became more confident after all that? Julian smiles. I've always had fears, but I'm willing to face most of those fears. What are you afraid of? Max feels the tension in his chest increase. Finishing his third beer of the night, he feels willing to express himself more than he usually would sober. Probably rejection, he answers. Yeah every man is at least a little scared of rejection. So how do I get over it? That's easy. Max leans in. You just have to face your fears. Go get rejected a hundred times and you'll realize how harmless it actually is. Max's anxiety increases just thinking about it. He grits his teeth and glares back at Julian with a surprised expression. That doesn't sound easy at all. Julian's tone suddenly turns more aggressive. What exactly is so difficult about it? You just ask a stranger if you can borrow a dollar or ask a girl to go on a date. They are simple actions. The worst that can happen is they say, no. But that's great because it makes you stronger. It helps you accept the reality that not everyone needs to love and approve of you all the time. Logically, I get what you are saying. But the idea of approaching a girl and starting a conversation or even asking for the time stresses me out. I can't control the anxiety, it's just how I am, Max explains as his shoulders droop, reflecting his attitude. You keep saying you can't control it, but that's just a belief you've invested in, Julian responds. Max rolls his eyes. So, I can make myself believe rejection doesn't matter? Sure. It'll be a bit uncomfortable at first, but you'll get used to it. Isn't it weird you are still afraid to talk to people even though you know what it's like to be as fearless as a god? My mind was messed up then, Max says. Maybe your mind is messed up now, offers Julian. But what do I say? Max asks. Doesn't matter. Go start a conversation with one of the girls over there. If you look awkward I'll come join you. A nervous sting bites Max in the chest at the suggestion. His inhibitions lowered by the alcohol, he decides to try. Okay, sure, but come help me out because I'm not good at talking to girls, he requests. 
he stands up and walks through the small crowd looking for an opportunity to practice accepting rejection. And there she is. Blonde hair. A cute smile on her face, an impeccable fashion. I know she'd never be interested in me, but what the hell? He walks towards her as she walks drink in hand. He looks down at his hand and notices it is shaking slightly. Julian was right. I once felt unbelievably fearless, and now I'm too afraid to even say hi to a stranger. Somehow, he forces himself to take another step towards her. And then another, until he is finally standing in front of her. His mind goes blank. She maintains eye contact and smiles. Hi, what's up, she initiates. Surprised she actually smiles and talks first, he feels a little relieved. I don't know. What? What are you drinking? Just orange juice. Please don't make fun of me for not drinking alcohol, she says with a slight giggle. No, that's fine. I should probably drink less too. So, again his mind struggles to think of something to say. Eventually, he has a great question. So, what's your name? Natasha. Oh, I'm Maximum. Nice meeting you, she says, smiling. The smile is comforting, and seems genuine, but Max has nothing to say and it quickly becomes awkward. Well Max, I'm going to go now. Have a nice night, she says and walks away to a nearby group of friends. Relieved the interaction is finally over, Max returns to the table where Julian is waiting. So how was it Max? Julian asks in anticipation. She wasn't rude about rejecting me. She seems really nice, but I still feel nervous. Julian finishes his beer and stands up. Well if you really are going to give up on that, then I'm taking her. He walks toward Natasha and her group of friends. Max sees them smile and laugh at whatever Julian is saying. Something about Natasha's smile makes him more than a little envious of Julian's social skills. If only I had confidence. He muses. Max stays by himself in that corner of the bar for the next few hours. He sees Julian dancing with Natasha, joking with her friends, and eventually, later that night, he sees the two of them leave together. 30. Fearless Max succeeds. Max stands outside a building. The first floor is a gym with weights and mats. The second floor contains a full-size boxing ring and punching bags. Outside, a sign states that it's Fearless Gym. A coach walks up to him. Morning boss, he says. Morning. How's it going? Max replies. Not bad. How's it feel to finally own your own gym? I never would have believed it was possible a decade ago. I stayed in Julian's company until I could afford to quit and build this gym. In the back of my mind I always wanted to do this. I heard he wasn't happy about that. Yeah, he's a bit of a jerk sometimes. He wanted me to help him make more money. I would have stayed though man and become a millionaire. Max laughs. I already have plenty of money. I was afraid to quit such a safe job. I liked it, but this is something I've always wanted to do. I wish you would have quit that day you gave me a concussion, the employee mutters with a smile. Max isn't sure if it's Marcus's dark humor or if he still holds some resentment for the day he won the state boxing championship against him. I'm glad you survived Marcus. Me too boss, he says smiling, before entering the gym. Max walks behind the gym to a large house. Its stone structure reminds him of a castle. He walks up to the door and inserts a key in the lock, opens the door, and enters. 
Inside, he sees his wife, Natasha is finally awake and stretching on a yoga mat. Forget something, she asks. I miss the house, so thought I'd come back for a bit, but now I miss my gym, he says laughing. Missed me, didn't you, she asks. Sure. I was wondering what time you'll come work out in the gym today, he asks. Same time as yesterday. I'm so happy you got a gym and it's right next to our house. I'll bake something for you and your coaches today too. Max smiles. Thanks. I'm so happy I finally have exactly the life I've always wanted. 31. Fearful Max goes to work. Medication leaves a foul aftertaste in his mouth after he washes it down with warm water. Max looks up at the frail, emotionless face staring back in the mirror. He coughs and reaches for his inhaler. Several deep inhalations slowly improve his breathing. For several days he's been coughing and suffering a tightness in his chest. It's fine. He reasons, as he doesn't want to be embarrassed by going to the hospital and finding out it's nothing serious. In truth though, a mild infection is making it difficult to breathe. His father helped him find a small apartment on the edge of the city. A psychiatrist said being close to nature might be good for his condition. An acquaintance of his father even offered him a job stocking shelves in a grocery store. It wasn't exactly what he wanted to do with his life, but at least he didn't need to interact with weird customers like the cashiers had to tolerate all day. The grocery store was set on the edge of a cliff overlooking a forested valley. Max only needed about half an hour to walk to work each night. Though working nights wasn't healthy, Max now preferred it to being surrounded by lots of people. Max steps out into the cool night air. He looks up and sees only a handful of stars twinkling through the ambient light. Walking down the sidewalk in silence each night has become a relaxing routine. Each step is almost meditative, but tonight, he steps on something and feels it squish beneath his shoe. Looking down, he sees a large green snake coiled around his foot. His whole body suddenly trembles in fear. He jumps away but the snake tangles around his feet causing him to fall. His hands strike the concrete sidewalk hard and fast as he plummets. No. Finally, he kicks the creature away. It doesn't move. Did I kill it? He wonders. Still breathing heavily, he forces himself to take a closer look. Instead of the dangerous reptile he expected, he suddenly realizes he was attacked by a harmless green rope left on the sidewalk. Finally, able to calm down, he examines the small scratch on his hand from his landing. It's fine, he reasons. He pulls out his inhaler and takes several puffs. He struggles to take deep breaths. Several minutes later, he is still wheezing and coughing. Eventually, he wheezes all the way to work. He greets the night shift manager with a barely audible, hi, and gets to work. It's an easy job. Dreams of achieving success in his own business have already disappeared from his mind. Instead, he reasons, it's much safer to keep a stable job to survive than to take big risks. Hours pass, and it gets even later. Still wheezing with each breath, Max continues to work. It's fine, he convinces himself. Finishing his inventory and shelf stacking tasks, he punches his time card and exits the employee office in front of the row of cashiers. Most aren't working at this late hour of course. Only one or two registers are left open. Max looks at a customer getting ready to leave the store. Max freezes in place and trembles slightly. Gary? Is it really the man that tormented him several years ago? Could he still be looking for him? 
Could he still be upset about the money his ex-girlfriend borrowed? He isn't sure but decides to hurry out of the store as quickly as possible to avoid notice, but it's too late. Gary looks in his direction and instantly recognizes Maximum Gary pauses for a moment, then slowly starts to walk in his direction. Max instantly panics. He reaches for the inhaler in his pocket and rapidly inhales, then steps back towards the exit. He tries to run but each step feels like his shoes are filled with concrete. Gary leaps forward and shouts at him. Hey wait a minute. Max runs but is slow and weak. The wheezing and coughing also make it challenging to catch his breath. Gary continues to give chase through the parking lot. Hey, I just wanna tell you something bro calm down, Gary shouts. But Max isn't convinced it's safe to hear him out. Running, however, is also dangerous as he feels close to exhaustion already. The only option is to hide in the dark shadows of the rocks and trees by the cliff's edge. Usually afraid of the dark, Max reasons nothing in there could be as scary as a psycho that beat him severely once. If he can find a safe place to hide, he can wait for Gary to give up and leave. Heart beating rapidly, he dives into a path covered only in shadows and runs. Gary continues to chase him. Hey, slow down. I didn't mean to scare you. But it's too late. Seized by fear, Max's heart and lungs pound at full capacity. Ignoring a painful cramp in his legs and concentrating on putting distance between himself and his pursuer, he doesn't see the large branch laying in his path. It hooks his ankle, tripping him. For the second time today, his hands strike the ground hard as he falls. However, this time, there is so much momentum that he continues to tumble forward. Right through a thorny bush and then over the edge of the cliff. He shrieks and whines as rocks, dirt, and pine needles scratch him on the way over. Gary vaguely makes out a silhouette collapsing and cursing in the dark and stops to catch his breath. You alright? he asks, but there is no answer. He walks closer and realizes the other side of the thorny bush is a long plunge straight down to the trees and river below. Oh crap! I'm so sorry man, he waits for a response, but there is none. Gary places his hands on his forehead and wipes off the sweat. I just wanted to apologize for before man. You didn't need to run. This is all on you, I'm not living with the guilt of this too. He turns around and carefully walks back to the well-lit area. On the other side of the cliff's edge, Max dangles from a thick tree root protruding from the ground. His fingers quickly ache from the desperate clinging. The combined stains of all his previous fears can't compare to the shock and anxiety surging through him now. He struggles to breathe through uncontrollable hyperventilation. Carefully, he tightens the grip on the gnarled tree root with his right hand as he moves his left hand down to his pocket. But it's gone. He tries to search for it in his other pocket. It isn't there either. It must have fallen out when he tripped over the edge of the cliff. I wish I was more careful with that stupid inhaler. He looks down. Nothing but darkness greets his eyes. He hears water rushing over the rocks below. Reaching up in search of something to pull himself up, he finds only a flat rock surface above the tree root. He resigns to gripping the root tightly. Still shaking in fear, and struggling to breathe, he cries. Help! Help me! He tries to yell, but nobody is near enough to hear his whimper for rescue. His weakened voice isn't loud enough to carry over the sound of the river and waterfalls below. The wheezing only gets worse as he feels his throat tighten. Several puffs from his inhaler could relax his airways and help him breathe normally. Without it, 
the combination of severe anxiety attack and infection could make breathing impossible. He tightens his grip on the tree root, but he already feels his muscles beginning to give out. I don't want to die. I can't jump down. I don't know what's below me. He imagines plummeting down into the darkness. The thought fills him with so much terror and stress that his hyperventilation worsens. Look at me now. Hanging alone in the dark, getting devoured by mosquitoes. He remembers back to his high school bullies and never having the courage to stand up to them. He remembers refusing to open up and be himself in many situations. He remembers being afraid to break up with his ex-girlfriend. He remembers being afraid of things as simple as asking strangers for directions. Instead of living his life, he let fear take control. And now, he was afraid to let go of that tiny slice of life. Somehow, he manages to cling to the root for three more hours. Each wheezing breathe becomes shallower as he feels his airways shrink. The muscles in his hands, arms, shoulders, and back ache horrifically from the struggle to stay attached to the dusty root. Choking and gasping for air, his grip finally loosens. Almost unconscious, he begs his arms to hang on just a little longer. But by now it's impossible. He slips off and falls. Another jolt of adrenaline shoots through his body. He feels an uncomfortable weightlessness in the pit of his stomach as he flies down. His body tenses up as he anticipates the long, painful landing. It doesn't come. Instead, only a few seconds into the fall, he lands on a large, flat stone outcropping hidden in the darkness below him the entire time. He feels both relieved and annoyed with himself that he could have jumped down any time and taken a now visible path out of the woods. But he's waited far too long. His airways have already constricted to a point where barely any oxygen is getting into his lungs and he's feeling very light-headed. In the hazy pre-dawn light, he sees it. His inhaler. Perched on the rock next to him. Close enough to grab. He slowly reaches for it with his cut up and exhausted hand, but it's too late. Inches away from the one thing that might have saved his life, he closes his eyes for the last time. It's fine. He reasons. 32. Fearless Max. Laying on an invisible table, Max opens his eyes in a room of blinding white light. Its bright walls remind him of a futuristic cathedral with towering, stone columns and strange robotic drones flying around. All the fears and pain of his last memory have somehow been stripped away. He sits up with a vague sense that his entire life was just a dream and somehow this is reality. Welcome back Max. He turns around and sees him. A tall, muscular man, but not just any man. It's like looking into a mirror magnifying his good qualities. How do you look like me? What's going on? Max demands. Look like you? Ha ha, I'm much better looking than you. I'm the you that could have been. What are you talking about? Where am I? Was that all just a dream? It wasn't a dream. I lived an ideal life and now my responsibility is to judge the versions of myself that squander our potential. I have to ask you some things to determine what happens to you next. First of all, what do you regret? His voice booms with so much confidence and authority Max finds it difficult to believe they could possibly be the same person. Still confused, Max isn't sure what to say. Not much. I guess my life was boring, but it's fine. Not much. You can't lie to me. I've been observing you. I know everything. I've even tried to help you a few times, but it's nearly impossible to send clear messages that could impact you. 
Every mistake you've made is your own responsibility. Max sighs. I regret being afraid of so many things. Ideal Max laughs again. You regret fear? It's only as big as you believe it is. Like needlessly clinging to a rotting tree root. You saw that. I saw everything. Fear destroyed your life. You needed more compassion. What do you mean? I tried to live my life, but I kept encountering problems. Eventually I just gave up on accomplishing anything. You didn't encounter problems. You encountered opportunities. You spend your whole life agonizing over what people think about you. For every time you even try to face a fear there were a hundred times you hid from them. You must drop your armor, be vulnerable. That is true strength. Fear strangles you. In your case literally. Max again recalls memories of running away from fears. Maybe I've realized that sometimes, but that feeling of fear just gets worse over time how was I supposed to do anything about it? That's the whole point. You can't grow with fear's vice-like grip around your neck. You'll be strangled until your creativity smolders and the life drains out of your eyes. Confident people can see that you know how lifeless and afraid you are. Fear is poisoning yourself while begging reality to take pity on you and let you live anyway. But that isn't how it works. You should face your fears sometimes, or else they chase you forever. But how do I take the first step when I don't feel brave at all? Max inquires. You get the courage after you take action, not before. You can't have courage unless you believe you've earned it. Then you slowly grow that courage until you're willing to face bigger challenges and risks. I know. I've always known. I've just always let fear take control. I wish I could do it over again. Is it really as simple as taking action? Ideal Max smiles. No. You also have to like yourself. You get a choice. You can go back, and you can finally face your fears. This life will become a hazy dream. Or you can end it all and spend eternity in regret. Max takes a deep breath and thinks about starting over. He could finally start going to the gym and learn martial arts like he always wanted. He could get a great girlfriend. He could finally have a great career and start his own business. He could finally relax and socialize with anyone. The first few steps might be uncomfortable, but he had to try. I'm ready. Max wakes up an hour early with a smile on his face. Flashes of a strange dream run through his mind. In the dream, he sees an ideal version of himself as a superhero. The hero encourages him to face his fears and live without regrets. Don't let Scott kill your confidence this time, the hero shouts just before Max shifts into wakefulness.